Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Baking Safari here in the northeastern corner of South Africa, the Greater Kruger National Park. 3.5 million hectares of wonderful wilderness drought-stricken wonderland that we are privileged to call home. My name is James Henry. On camera today we've got Brian. Hello, Brian. Hello, James. That's Brian's thumb. He's a lot larger than the small piece of him that you can see here. Six foot three indeed. And um, topped with a beautiful hat and matching blue buff. On the other vehicle, we have got Brent Leo Smith on the camera with a pair of dark glasses small enough to fit a small child. And Jamie, also topped with a spanky new blue hat. They are heading down towards what is hopefully a lion sighting. Reports of a lion pride crossing onto Dvuya Tela this, this morning, chasing a herd of buffalo, the remnants of which you can see behind us here. We haven't seen those lions yet, and so that's what they're doing down in that particular area. You are on a live Sunset Safari if you happen to stumble across this feed, either on Safari Live or perhaps on YouTube. Please remember, we'd love to hear from you. Talk to us if you're a new viewer. Tell us where you're from. Ask us some questions. I know some of you will be watching this thinking this can't possibly be live. Uh, you fall into the category that Thomas fell into, the apostle, uh, the doubting variety thereof and we will prove to you that we are live. Send us a question, tell us where you're from. We'd love to hear from you. My plan this afternoon is to head, well, we're at the first water hole I'm going to head to, and we've got some buffalo, you can see. There are some zebra, a beautiful little kinship group of zebra heading off towards the shade of quarantine clearings. There is a young nyala. There is, in fact, there's a herd of adult female nyala, and there are also a number of little guinea fowl, which you might be hear, hearing going on the ground. And it's a very peaceful, beautiful afternoon. It's not quite as baking as it has been. It's about 32 to 33 degrees centigrade. That's 89 to 91 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a pleasant breeze blowing out of the southeast. Rain, none in the offing for the next week or so. So those of you who have been watching regularly will probably be slightly disappointed that the drought is not about to break any time soon. Right, without further ado, well, I suppose we could actually sit here for a little while. It's quite fun to look at the zebra. Now, they have been obviously had a drink at the water hole down there, and they are now grazing up on some of the last clearings with grass on them in the place. The quarantine clearings, which is up through there, has now almost entirely grass-free. It's just full of little green forbs and bare patches of sand. And this particular area seems to have ma magically hold, uh, managed to hold on to the grass. I'm not sure how exactly, but there is, uh, does seem to be a little bit of grass left here. So that's what the zebra are enjoying. They don't seem to be suffering too much yet. The condition still looks good. You can tell that zebra are losing condition if their manes start to lie down and that's because they're held in place, the mains are, by a layer of fat. And once that layer of fat starts to get used up under nutritional stress, so the hair of the mane will begin to lie down. Buffalo, it's much more easy to see because their hips start to show. They start to look very skinny very quickly. Now, they look okay, but their close relatives, the domestic cattle that live in the villages just outside the reserve that we find ourselves in now, are looking pretty emaciated and awful. And so while the animals here are suffering, well, suffering to a certain extent, make no mistake that the animals outside the reserve and the people outside the reserve, remember there's no reticulated water in the villages out here, they are suffering even more. They're having to go further and further away from home to fetch sufficient water to get through each day. So the drought doesn't just affect us here on the game reserve. Now, those are an interesting group of buffalo because they are remnants of a larger herd. They're females and a young male, I think. Yep, that's right. In fact, two young males and a female. And there are a couple of old bulls still in the pan, still in the water there. But the rest of the herd, I think, is dispersed somewhere, and I'm not really sure where. Perhaps onto quarantine clearings. And perhaps they've gone off to chew the cud somewhere in the shade. Right, that's it from this sighting. Let's head on, see if we can find some kind of 
uh, other animal activity, perhaps around the Galago waterhole. So our plan is to go around here towards the Galago waterhole. From there, we're going to go up towards Sydney's dam, check around there. Uh, been lots of elephant activity, lots of other animal activity around there over the last hot days as the water starts to dry out completely. And then, of course, we're hoping that the wild dogs will return out of Simbambili at some stage during the evening, possibly heading up to either quarantine clearings or towards Sydney's dam to see what they can find there. Right, that is the plan. Let us go. Brian, you're not hearing any... Oh, there we go. Final control is, in fact, talking to me. I thought I'd done something wrong. Hello, Ernie. You're on YouTube, and it's wonderful to hear from you. You're a new viewer. Welcome to it, and thank you for taking the time, A, to watch us, and B, to send us a question. You want to know if a zebra is related to a horse? Absolutely, Bernie. They, Ernie, they look the same because they are the same. A horse is part of the equid family, equidae, and so is a zebra. They're part of the same genus, even. I think that a horse's um, Latin name is, uh, I think it's probably something like Equus domesticus, and the zebra is Equus bercelli, so they're very closely related indeed. They can't interbreed, as far as I know, or well, they can, but they produce an infertile offspring, just like um, they would, just like a mule, for example. So very closely related to horses and donkeys. Thank you, Ernie, for your question. Send through some more if you like. So here we are at the pan. And at the pan here, we have got a hippopotamus. And on the back of the hippopotamus is a serrated hinged terrapin. Now, for many of you, you won't know what a terrapin is because you don't get them in all parts of the world. A terrapin is like a freshwater turtle. And I know lots of you are watching in the States and what you would refer to as a turtle, we would only refer to as a sea-dwelling chelonid or shelled animal. In a freshwater version, we'd call a terrapin. And then the land-dwelling versions are called tortoises. That's what we'd call tortoises. And also in the pan, the old buffalo bulls no longer interested in trying to fight for mating opportunities in the herd. They've retired, they're on pension, and they just spend their days here at the bar drinking uh, what is uh, probably a very sort of, um, well, an acquired taste if you're drinking the kind of soup that has been made soupish by the buffalo dung and the hippo dung over the last few months. Okay. Oh, quick question, sorry. We had a question, a, sorry, just looking there, ah, yes. Tony, you wanted to know about fatalities in the Kruger National Park as a result of the drought. Tony, we haven't seen any here, but there are reports of baby hippo dying. In fact, there was one, in fact, on Biffle's Hook last night. Craig called in that there was a dead baby hippopotamus, and I'm sure that's as a result of the drought. Right. That buffalo's getting up. He looks slightly upset with life. I'm not surprised. He looks to have a particularly swollen scrotum. And uh, that is, of course, enough to put a frown on anyone's face. On that note, let's head across to Jamie, find out what she and Brent are doing, and I'll catch up with you possibly at the Gallagher Waterhole. Salutations, one and all, and welcome to our part of the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie, and once again, I have Brent Leo Smith on camera with me this afternoon. And we're looking this afternoon for lions. We got a report from one of the Simba Billy guides that they had tracks crossing into Juma from the Gauri Main Triple M, so the southwestern corner of Juma, onto this sort of area. And it looked as though they were chasing buffalo now. Having had that conversation and that little quiz yesterday about the road grader and the tracks that it leaves and smoothing out the road, unfortunately, <laughs> it's come back to bite me this afternoon because the roads that I haven't driven today have been dragged. I want 
that means is that if the lions did walk here early this morning whilst we were distracted with a fantastic wild dog sighting at Sydney's Dam, if they did come along here, their tracks have been unfortunately obliterated. And now it just becomes a question of guesswork. Hopefully we might see a little pinprick of a toe, the edge of a toe, the part of a back pad, something along those lines to give us a little bit of a hint as to which way the lions went. That being said, I think our next step, I know that James's plan is to check most of the water holes around the area. I think my plan will be to head across to Treehouse Dam. I've done the full circuit of that corner. No sign of tracks going in, and we chatted a bit about it, Brent and myself. I just said that the road being as busy as it is, especially if the lines were running, might only put, they might only put four feet on the ground on the road before getting to the other side. Those enormous strides lions are capable of making. So there's still a good chance that the lions are somewhere around here, hiding off in the shade. The other thing we're looking for as we continue our search, we know that they were chasing buffalo. We did have those two large buffalo herds at Sydney's Dam, and I believe that James found one in this area this morning as well. It's probably the herd that the lions were chasing. The other thing that we're looking for is if they were successful by this stage on a hot afternoon, there's a very good chance that a kill like that would have already attracted the attention of vultures. They might be congregating around some of the larger trees, waiting for their waiting patiently for their opportunity to feed on the carcass. But I do think there's a slight irony to the fact that I asked you such a tricky question about the grading road. <laughs> now obliterated by tracks. James Richards is saying that he likes my new hat. Thank you very much. The hat was a present from Kirsty McKinnon Smith in Final Control, who very kindly lent it to me after it was decided by one and all that really that giant sized hat that was probably built more for somebody of Brent's size than mine that kept falling over my eyes and obliterating my vision or at least obscuring it, maybe wasn't the best way forward. Tried a different tack. Kirsty and I are sort of roughly the same size. I'm just a little bit taller though, aren't I, Kirst? So I've got her hat for the duration of the afternoon. <laughs> I wonder where these lines have gone. It's also got the, actually, the just on the subject of this hat, and thank you, Kirsty the added advantage of being dark, which really does help to absorb the glare of the afternoon sun. And I've noticed, I'm not sure what it is about this particular summer. I don't know if it's because the vegetation is so reduced, the leaves are less dense, or if there's less grass so the earth is reflecting it back. I don't know what it is about the summer, but I've never experienced glare as I have here at this particular time of this particular year. I think it must be that. I think it's the lack of vegetation and the extra sand covering, or at least less grass obscuring it. And this dust is quite, the soil is quite light in color. And it bounces back the sun. Nice to have a dark hat on to reduce some of those effects. And of course, that's a tactic not just utilized by human beings. Sports stars will pull those, put those dark stripes underneath their cheeks or on their cheekbones. Something that our diurnal predators also do. So the tears of a cheetah, those dark stripes that run from the corner of the eyes down towards the mouth, those are serving exactly the same purpose as my dark hat is serving now. Just absorbing some of that glare. We know that dark colors absorb more light, at least more heat. Oh, dust. This road has definitely been beautifully graded. Darlene in New Hampshire, still with her track 
striking fascination. I believe that Darlene is really fascinated by the entire process. She was wondering a little bit, and Darlene, I'm struggling fractionally with the radio communication, but from what I can understand of your question, you're talking about the fact that grass will get pressed down, and is this a technique that we use during tracking? when we're following animals, and there's two ways in which grass, there's a couple of ways, but one of the ways in which grass can be very helpful in tracking first is if it's dewy and you are tracking first thing in the morning, something moving through the grass dislodges all of the water droplets where it's walked and leaves a nice dark path where the dew otherwise shines. That, of course, is when there is grass that's sort of higher than about this big, which we haven't really had this season. And usually these areas, particularly around the sea plants and even for example quarantine would have had patches of grass that could easily be knee high if not waist high in places it's just not quite the way things have panned out this year and then darlene yes you can occasionally see imprints it's usually the heavier animals that will leave the clearest imprints of where they've walked along the grass and they might, if they've been bathing in mud or walking through mud, they might leave a little bit of those tracks on the grass as well. But you have to be hot on the track, hot on fresh tracks to be able to spot that. Sometimes grass springs back fairly quickly in the summer months when it's got plenty of water content or high water content and high elasticity. Buffalo definitely came along here looking at all of the pets and they've pretty dried out by now. There are lots of tracks coming through here. Brent said he heard the buffalo on quarantine. Just trying to basically guess which way the lions have gone. I'm hoping they might have, if they had a long and unsuccessful chase of buffalo, they might have flopped down near Treehouse Dam for a drink and a bit of shade and rest and just to update you all unfortunately rusty once again similar to yesterday afternoon appears to be having some difficulty with aerials hello stemboki i saw these two on our way in one little female there mostly observing us here we go round belly little thing and although I don't think you can see him from where Brent is sitting it's a little male just behind those bushes there they're very common to find these this particular tiny antelope species in pairs they do mate for life you most of the time they spend their day foraging alone but a couple of hundred meters from each other and since they've got such tiny little territories they're always within each other's vicinity mysterious little creature that unlike the common dacre or the gray dacre which is of a similar size and occupies a very similar niche in the environment a little one of the only antelope species that buries their dung or attempts to i've never seen a fully buried steenbok midden but they do scratch dirt over it like your domestic cat might do in its litter box i guess a way of trying to mask its scent. Nobody really has a complete explanation. I don't know if you know of any other explanation for why they bury their dung. Monogamous in that they mate for life, but not necessarily monogamous in that they won't sire or they won't produce any offspring by other males or females. Mysterious little things, Steenbok. Although they live together and they will stay with one partner for the duration of their lives, or for either of them, unless one of them dies they will still take the opportunity or some of them will take the opportunity to mate with incoming males that might trespass across so although they're territorial males fight off males females fight off females but if a male happens to come across an unknown female he'll take his opportunity to spread his genetics further down the line and the female will do much the same thing and of course for new viewers since you can't see the male the little female doesn't have any horns. The male has tiny, sharp little spikes on the top of his head for horns. Little grooves that run along them. I don't know if it's my imagination or if she's quite round-bellied. Maybe it's just the 
position that she's found herself in. I'm terribly obliging, though. They have an interesting flight or freeze response, and in this case, she's completely frozen, watching us. Trying to decide if she needs to dash off or stay still. A tactic that would work very well in midsummer, carrying on our grass conversation, if the grass was long and obscuring her. Okay, girl, you can carry on. I'll try and creep forward, but I think as soon as I start moving, there's a chance they're going to dash away. Mind you. that we want to get this afternoon, whether it be leopard or lion, whether it's through tracking or by getting lucky, James wanted to know, why don't we microchip or collar the animals that we're trying to find as a way of monitoring their movements? And it would certainly make life a little bit easier in terms of finding them. James, there are certain, there are certain animals that are being monitored by scientific groups. They are fitted with radio collars. I don't know of any microchipped animals out here in particular, but I have seen quite a few buffalo herds with radio collars and elephant herds with radio collars. And those probably you'll find that those collars also send up GPS coordinates at regular intervals. Now the reason why we don't collar or chip most of our the animals around here is first of all it's actually quite an expensive process. You need to get a vet out. It involves anaesthetizing the animal in order to fit it. And in the case of collars or trackers, they don't last forever. So once you've fitted them, you've got to keep replacing the batteries. It, it depends on what you're using the collar for, but it can be anything from a year to every three years. You still have to find that animal and anaesthetize them. It's also got to be done on animals that are, no, that are not going to be growing necessarily for the most. You do get collars that can expand they are much more expensive. So basically it's just, it's not worth the cost versus reward in this particular instance. That doesn't mean that their movements aren't monitored or tracked. You know that Panthera records all of the sighting data for all of the lodges, all of the guides, pretty much throughout this area and through most of the Sabi sands. So they get to build up interesting maps of the distribution and the movements of the animals that move through here. Unless it's something that is funded by research groups and put forward with a good proposal that justifies the level of interference that it involves and in searching for that animal, tracking them, darting them. It's generally not something, and certainly there's not enough money in conservation for it to be done for every single animal that we see. All right, down to Treehouse Dam. What a beautifully smooth road. It's lovely. No tracks, nothing. While we keep our eye out for any sign of the lions, including the vultures coming down to rest, taking a chance to have an opportunity to feed once the lions move off. Karen, who is a Zimbabwean living in the UK, Karen would like to know a little bit more about vultures. And she's heard basically that different types of vultures or different species of vultures feed on different parts of the carcass. And is this the case? And it's absolutely true, but I'm going to explain it in a bit further detail now stop at an impala herd without looking for Nelson and I'm 
conceding that name is better. Just. No sign of him here, though. He often wanders around Treehouse Dam. I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks now. Nelson, for those of you who haven't been on board with us from the beginning, Nelson is a one-horned, one-eyed impala that we've been keeping track of recently. What was it? It was his left horn that was missing. His left horn and his left eye. Because I think... Oh, no, that's, a, that's just a normal impala. No sign of Nelson. I've got to the point where I'm checking every single impala herd or bachelor herd that I go through. Karen, with the vultures, certain vultures are better adapted at feeding from different parts of the carcass. So from the biggest, the leopard-faced vultures within this area that you might see, down then to the white back to the slightly smaller level, and the white-headed, and even on one occasion, I've seen a cape vulture here as well, those are all fairly similar in size and where they get to feed. And then right at the bottom of that little hierarchy sits the hooded vultures with a very small, very thin beak. So their beaks are adapted to be able to feed on different parts of the carcass, but most importantly, their hierarchy is governed by size. And if you've ever seen a vulture feeding how would I describe it? Malay, Malay, where they're all fighting for access to the carcass. The biggest vulture gets the best access for food, and in that case, it's the leopard-faced vultures with their huge tin opener-like beaks, capable of breaking open the skin, even of the toughest carcass, well, not the toughest carcass, but even in cases where this carcass hasn't been opened by something like a lion or a leopard, they're more than capable of breaking that open, and they're also capable of bullying the other vultures and pushing them away and getting the best access and quite often you'll watch and you'll see the hooded vultures really have to get pushed really get pushed to the outskirts don't know if there's any water left in treehouse i'm going to go check from the dam wall still no sign of any tracks coming through here so Karen, it's a combination of their physiological adaptation, so the way that their beaks are structured, as well as their size that determines the feeding hierarchy of vultures at a carcass. It's one of the noisiest things you can experience. If you get a really large group of vultures, if you get 50 or 60 vultures feeding on a rather complete carcass, as we had a couple of months ago with the buffalo carcass the Birmingham boys left behind. Hello, Otto. I'm just going to show you the view of the water first before I move on, just in case it proves to be one of our more skittish warthogs of Juma. Already looking at us askance. Hello, warthog. Well, there's no sign of lions, but there's definitely plenty of life at Treehouse Dam. Impalas clustering together in what little bits of shade they can get. Quick scratch in the groom. It's a nice large herd of impala. There's actually impala all around. There's at least, I would say, at least 50 of them here. On this dry day, and in these hot days, this is quite an interesting reminder of just what kind of impact these weather conditions have on these sorts of areas. And there's one topic that we haven't addressed, I think, for a while. I'm just trying to see if there's any water in there. So those holes there have been dug out by elephants, and they've managed to get access to the natural seat lines that run beneath the soil of Treehouse Dam. There's usually a little bit of water trickling in. Oh, what's going on here? I think that might be males causing mischief more than anything else. I think deja vu for a second. I know. Well, there are wild dogs somewhere here. Where are the wild dogs? 
That would be completely unexpected, I think. Unfortunately, we might have tapped out that luck once. This morning might be a bit much. Twice in one day. Surely not. Ah. I can hear the sounds of a male pushing his weight around in the Impala herd. Where are we? We're in February. There's a couple of late births still happening, which might still be confusing the poor male Impala who mistake pregnancy hormones for estrus hormones and think that they're going to have a mating opportunity. And every now and again they get a little bit too caught up in that excitement and chase the females around. That or something spooked them. Very often with animals that live on alert as, as sort of as often as these guys do, as soon as one antelope, even if it's a franklin or something that stirs in the grass and gives one a fright and starts to run, the rest of them sort of run and ask questions later. They don't really stop to find out why the other antelope is running, which makes sense. If it's a wild dog chase, you don't actually want to spend time looking to see where the wild dogs are. You just run. You just follow your neighbor and hope for the best. The fact that the rest of them are still on the other side of the bank looking fairly relaxed suggests to me that that was just a false alarm. If that had been wild dogs rushing through twice in one day and for the fourth time in three days, it would have been a little bit, it would have been bordering on the absurd that we've been that lucky. That being said, there were wild dog tracks on Triple M, wandering backwards and forwards. Okie dokie, where to next? Do we go left? Do we go right? I think we go right. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I got completely distracted by the animals sprinting past us. Hello, babes. Ah, oh, it was a bit too good to last. I've oh, got a little bit of a limp. Oh, we've been spoiled not just with wild dog sightings. Promise, Carter, I will get to your question in one moment. Sorry, I keep getting distracted. We've had a couple of really nice wild dog sightings, but we've also had some really nice warthog sightings, which is a pleasure because when I first arrived here, warthog sightings were probably rare, good warthog sightings where they actually stuck around, were probably rarer than leopard sightings when I first started here. And warthogs generally took one look at us and raced away. So it's nice that we've had a couple of families move in to around the area around Juba that are much more relaxed in the presence of cars. Hello, Mbala. Lots of you. as it is and the animals clustered around the water holes. Carter's question makes complete sense to those of you who see this from your perspective. But Carter wants to know, with the conditions being as dry as they are, what are the chances of fire? Do wildfires ever break out and are any animals ever lost in them? And I'm going to preface this by saying that fires in the bush are actually not a bad thing. Not every year, but regular cycles of fire, repeated sort of, and it depends on management strategies, every five years, every seven years, depending on where you are. Essentially, fire is a naturally occurring element. It plays a role in, in leveling the balance between the grass layer and the woodland layer. So burns do happen, and in certain areas, controlled burns, deliberately set controlled burns happen, but it has to be done at the correct time of year and with the correct approach. At the moment, I think you would seriously struggle to start a fire out here. And the reason I say that is because we've now got to the point in the drought where there's nothing to burn. The ability of a fire to spread is severely diminished. There's no grass, there's no real grass cover for it. I think it would burn itself out very, very rapidly. I think you would struggle to start it without some kind of deliberate propellant. I don't know what you think, Brett. I think it would be almost impossible to start a fire. And that's going to continue until the end, not of this dry season, which is coming up next, but the end of next year's dry season, depending on the rainfall that we get during the summer months, the next year's summer months. Because that is when the drought is not necessarily predicted to end, 
but certainly we're, we're due to get our next big rains. So if the plant life recovers sufficiently during that time, then we'll be able to start thinking more about fires. Last year, because this drought didn't actually... Oh, Bala, sorry. Boy, there's just a car that everywhere here. No lions, though. Just give me one second. There's one of the landowners wants to just know if there's any updates. Ah, there we go. Ephraim jumped on board to give him an answer. What was that? Oh, yes, we were chatting about fires. In terms of, Carter, in terms of fires that actually can kill animals, oh, I was chatting about last year's season. So last year was the beginning of our lack of rainfall. The year before that, we had quite high rainfalls, and in fact, there were some severe floods throughout the low felt. Last year, we had about, I would say in certain areas, between a fifth and a fourth, so between a fifth and a quarter of the average annual rainfall. This year has been even less. But last year, it was particularly serious. We had a couple of runaway fires in the area that I was working in that were caused by lightning strikes during dry storms. So the storms rolling in, the pressure building, and the lightning striking, but without any real rain. So a little bit of drizzle here and there. And one of the lightning strikes hit a dead tree and sent a blaze up that was unbelievable to witness fires and i'm sure many of you have actually in one way or another had some experience with wildfires when there is burning material it's quite a scary thing the sky changes color you've got birds swooping in to catch the insects and they move so incredibly fast and it's this roar of sound i find personally i find wildfires uncontrolled bushfires quite intimidating even controlled bushfires at times can switch in two seconds if the wind decides to swirl or move around friends telling me maybe it was beautiful oh you got a track at the junction useful having Brent on the back as well. Not that our regular cameramen are terrible at finding tracks, but naturally Brent has a very practiced eye on board. See them from where you are. I'm just going to switch off. I need to just change my angle of where I am so I can see. Just take it off. Mm -hmm. Big hyena. Oh. Tricky, tricky. There are some enormous hyenas on Juno with feet almost the size of lioness tracks. And they seem to be everywhere at the moment. Those hyenas are ruling the roost. I find their tracks on every single road on Juma. Every day, it seems. <laughs> Gowrie Main or Gowrie Main? That's what I think as well. In terms of animals that die during wildfires, most of them are fast enough to escape. Occasionally, there are terrible instances where, for example, herds of elephants get trapped. Those are fairly unusual instances. Most of the animals will run away. And if it's a fire that's done in the correct way, it gives animals plenty of space to move out of the area and into safer areas. And they know instinctively, and you'll find it very frequently, as soon as you've burnt an area, if, you, if there's another area that's going to burn, quite often they make their way back to where the burnt area or where the fire has just passed through. And that's also an important lesson to remember if you're a human being trapped in a bushfire. A fire cannot burn where it's just burnt. And even bushfires that go f are set or are happening during windy days, windy conditions, even tortoises can actually escape them. If the fire is moving at a sufficiently rapid rate, although the tortoise cannot outrun it, they are able to retract into their shell and the fire passes past them and they're able to survive that. That, that of course, is on condition that it's a rapidly moving fire, not a slow or warm, hot burning fire. There's lots of different techniques and there's lots of studies that have been done into the way in which areas should be burned. 
and should be managed and how often and how to go about it. No sign of these mystery lions. I wonder if these tracks have been dragged. the ball and has actually witnessed vulture feeding frenzies has also seen 20 vultures wow this wind is quite strong has also seen 20 vultures feeding on a carcass with marabou storks involved marabou storks of course being those very really large quite ugly i mean honestly I, I generally have a soft spot for most unpleasant looking creatures but really marabou storks are just quite ugly still fascinating birds and incredible birds to see how and Karen wants to know where do they fall within that hierarchy and I've seen them chase off white-backed vultures before or chase away white-backed vultures. I've also seen lappet faced have serious confrontations with them. So they fall somewhere around the top of the hierarchy, Karen, but not necessarily the top. And now I'm distracted but I think it's hyena tracks. If you've ever witnessed, and Pirate maybe will be familiar with this, witnessing the feeding frenzy of vultures around a large carcass, the screams that they make, those really loud screeches, were actually in certain parts of the Jurassic Park movies, what they used, what they based the dinosaurs' noises on, and really does sound like that. Those screeching sounds are very prehistoric sounding. Lost my hat. Brent saved my hat. Thank you. <laughs> it is that windy out here. Thank you, Brent. vultures. Eric Moore has said, is it true that they don't have feathers around their heads to reduce the soiling when they stick their heads into those carcass or carcasses? And Eric, yes, they do have slightly bolder faces than the other birds of prey, the other raptors, but they still have feathers. The hooded vultures still have a cap of feathers. The white-backed vultures have feathers pretty much around most of their face. Really, the lapid faced vultures also have a couple of feathers around as well. It does reduce soiling, but often Often one of the first things a vulture will do is go straight from a carcass across to a, the nearest water source and have a quick swim or a wash within it. And unfortunately at times like these, although it's still quite unusual and there haven't been too many cases yet, but as soon as we start recording anthrax cases, it's one of the ways in which vultures can be one of the vectors of the anthrax spores. Still concentrating on finding these lions. So far, no sign of them or the vultures, in fact. In the meantime, I believe that a fix has been con or a fix has been applied to Rusty, and it seems to be up and running. So let's find out what James's plans are. Hello, everybody. Sorry about the long hiatus on our game drive, Rusty. Dirty Rusty. Lost her aerial. So Eugene has reaffixed it with a lot of glue. There was supposed to be a screw used as well. The screw, unfortunately, is stripped entirely as a result of the wild dog sighting of two days ago. This, of course, was an extremely, uh, shall we say, exciting sighting where the car was expected to do things that something with a spiky thing out the back is not normally expected to do. That is why the aerial is in the state it is. Never mind, it's how it goes out here. We don't mind. We've come to the Gallagher waterhole as per our original plan. Lo and behold, what do you see, Brian? A buffalo. Buffaloes. How oh, surprising. They're never here. Now, we came here this morning, and this morning there was a hyena looking into the bush, and we thought it might be that he was looking 
at a leopard in the middle of the bush, but it seems I don't think there was a leopard. That's what we were hoping. Now, we have another wonderful question from a wonderful new viewer called Susie DeFuzzy. Hello, Susie DeFuzzy. You want to know where the safari is taking place? Ah, sorry. Fizzy de Fuzzy, not Susie, Fizzy de Fuzzy, as in fizz pop. Uh, <laughs> you are a new viewer. It's wonderful to have you with us, and you want to know where in the world we are. Fizzy, we are in South Africa, the southernmost country in, in Africa, vast continent of wildlife, forests, deserts, savannas, and what we call here woodlands, Combrita Woodland that you can see there. And we're in an area called the Kruger National Park, which you may well have heard of. Kruger National Park, one of the most iconic Kruger. national parks in the world. I'm just going to turn this radio down because if I don't, it'll drive me stark raving insane within three and a half seconds. Okay, I've managed to turn it down before the next transmission. Uh, Fizzy, that means that we're in the northeast corner of South Africa and this expansive wildlife land extends north into Zimbabwe and then east into Mozambique as well. So it really is an enormous piece of land. It is probably, I think it's about five and a half times the size of Yellowstone National Park, for example. So it is huge. We don't traverse that whole area. We traverse a small section on the western side of it called Juma and Arethusa to the west of that, where there are commercial safari lodges. And then us as, as well, driving around, trying to find the wonders of the African wilderness and bring those to you wherever you happen to be in the world. So welcome, Fizzy, and I hope you stay with us and ask us more questions and send us more comments. Thanks very much for taking the time to come and see us. Um, so these are buffalo, of course. We've seen lots of buffalo today already. I don't think we're going to hang around out here too long, but to say that one of them is doing yoga, as you can see. This is very important for old buffalo as it is for old people. It's important to keep the flexibility up, and that buffalo is clearly on a health kick doing his yoga stretch for the day. Geraldine, of course, who's directing, is big on yoga. Uh, she, will give us, she will give us a sort of a impression of his form. Geraldine, out of 10? I'm not sure what you call that position. A pigeon pose. He gets four out of ten for his pigeon oh, pigeon job, pose, which I think for a 14-year-old buffalo is not bad going. Well done, old boy. Pigeon pose. Okay, we're not going to hang around here. What I would like to do now is head towards Sydney's dam. That is a large dam to the north of us, inside Biffelsook, where we can't really go, but we can see it. And with the super zoom on this camera, basically, we can find a tick at the far end of the dam. I'm hoping we're going to see more than a tick, perhaps some elephants. It's quite a hot day. It's not a very hot day at all, but the animals will need to drink, especially, remember, as every day that we don't get rain, the leaves on the trees and in the grass, of course, have less and less moisture in them, and that means that there's more and more need for the browsers and grazers of the area to drink. So that is our plan from here. I believe that Jamie and Brenty have not managed to see the lions just yet. Hello, raid freak. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I cannot, I cannot keep a straight face when saying some of these Twitter handles. I think that's wonderful. Raid freak. Well, Raid Freak, you ask a very valid question and to one which I don't believe you'll, you'll believe the answer to. You want to know what does this area actually look like when it isn't in a drought? You won't believe how green it is. If I ask Brian to just pan off into the left here, that kind of area you would probably see less than 10% of the depth that you're seeing now because there'd be so many thick trees full of thick verdant green leaves, the ground would be covered with grass, long grass, long green grass. And you'd probably also find that as we look forward, you can see obviously a blindingly bright sky in front of us. That would be a much deeper blue, and normally on an afternoon like this, a summer February afternoon, what we'd find is that there were clouds building in the west, and the hope of a thunderstorm in the afternoon would be in the offing. Now, that, of course, is just not happening at the moment. And that's part, apparently, of El Nino, 
which is a weather system beyond the comprehension of my small brain. And there's a brilliant idea here from Jerry. She says, if you have any screenshots of the summer, say around, well, as early as you can from last year, so January or February last, uh, last year, if you've got any screenshots saved on your machines, tweet them through, hashtag Safari Live, and show those of our new viewers who've never seen it green what it looks like. You won't believe the difference. It really is quite astonishing. And Raid Freak, I think you also asked what level of water, the, what the water level of water normally is. Well, I can only tell you what, how much rain we get. We get up to 600 millimeters a year. That's about 24 inches of rain. Um, it varies sort of between 450 millimeters, which is in, I'm just trying to work it out exactly. So it'll be 12 plus six, 18 to 24 inches is the kind of average that we'd get around here. Freak, I agree with you completely. You say perhaps we should change the pigeon pose attempted by that buffalo to the buffalo pose, and instead of getting a fairly nasty four out of ten, he'd get a nine or ten. I think that buffalo would definitely get a nine out of ten for the buffalo pose. I wouldn't attempt the pigeon pose. I think it would hurt a great deal. I'm going to ask Geraldine to demonstrate the pigeon pose to us when I get back from drive. She says she'll show us as long as we don't film her. Of course we won't film her. Now, Wolfie, Wolfie, you are in London. Hello, Wolfie. You want to know, should a buffalo decide that it doesn't like you and you're on foot and it charges you, what should you do? Well, Wolfie, um, with a buffalo, normally I'd, what I want to just reiterate here is, and, and I mean, I'm assuming your question is coming from the point of view that you probably heard that buffalo are extremely dangerous, which I don't believe necessarily to be the truth. I don't believe any animal out here is inherently dangerous. There are plenty of animals that are potentially dangerous, and a buffalo falls into that category. And were you to threaten a buffalo to the extent that it felt like it could not move away from you, that it was, it was cornered and there was no other way for it to get away from you other than to charge you, your only course of action then, Wolfie, would be to climb a tree. And if you couldn't do that, then you'd have to try and stand your ground and shout. And with any luck, the buffalo will stop. But with a charging buffalo bull, the best thing to do is get at a bit of height. They're not very tall. So you get up a tree and you'd normally be OK. But I just want to reiterate, the chances of that happening, I mean, I was tracking the other day and we were not paying particular attention. And the buffalo stood up in front of us, probably, you see where that greenish bush is just in front there? He stood up, we were sitting where I am now. That's at a distance of about 10 to 15 meters in feet 45 to say 50 feet. And he stood up in front of us and he went <sighs> Looked up, there he was. And he was surprised because he'd probably been lying there watching us coming for some time. And instead of kind of waiting for us and then getting up and chasing us, he basically said, what are you doing? Are you mad? Go away. And that's what we did. We backed off. We did actually go up a small fallen down tree just in case he decided to push through. But he didn't. He just walked off eventually. And so that's generally what a buffalo will do if you see it on foot. So thank you, Wolfie, for your question. I'm always intrigued by questions like that because I think it's very important for people to understand that I think there are a lot of misconceptions about living out here, living in the wild, and while it is a very wild place, there's always the chance that something can go wrong. You could walk into an elephant by mistake. You could step on, you know, if you're walking around at night, you've got to be quite careful that there are no lions or hyenas or leopards around the place. If you were walking around at night, you try and avoid doing that sort of thing. So you do have to be careful, but this is not a dreadfully dangerous environment to be in. I don't believe it to be any more dangerous than living in a big city. 
and there are thousands of people or thousands of safari guides around the continent with very short khaki shorts on their on their um, on their legs and uh, enormous knives in their belts like sort of Excalibur and you know you, you see this quintessential thing where the guests get out of the plane on the airstrip to be met by this great you know broad brawny fellow with his shirt undone to here his great big knife in his belt and his tiny short shorts and he says oh wait let me just check the surrounds for danger and he looks around like this and he says okay come climb on the vehicle but keep an eye out for what's going on here it's very dangerous out here and that's kind of been built up as the way things are out here it's just not the same and I think we're thankfully moving away from that, but I still see guides like that around the place. This is a place of wilderness. It's a place of primal connection with the earth. It's, not a, pl and it's a place of wilderness adventure, but it's not a place of extreme adrenaline sports. I hope I've made myself kind of understood there. Right, we're now on the northern boundary of the reserve. We're heading now in a westerly direction towards the mountains of the Drakensberg in the far distance, which you may be able to see. And Sydney's dam is just up ahead and to the north, which is to the right-hand side of your screen. Thank you, James, on YouTube. You have a fantastically good name. You say that the Wilderbliss video that Brian and I made the other day uh, was very nice. I thank you very, very much for your kind compliments. Uh, what we do sometimes on a quiet drive while, um, if you're off with Jamie or Brent or Scott, Brian and I will say, film something quickly and then we'll add, we'll layer on a, a track to this uh, incredible app on the phone. And then you could layer it all together and within half an hour you can produce a little video. And so that's what we like to do on a quiet day's drive. Right, we're approaching Sydney's Dam now. You can see the clouds building over the western horizon there. And in a normal summer's day, they'd get much bigger. Virginia on Twitter, while we approach, or just before we approach Sydney's Dam, I just want to look at these little birds. There they are. They're called kivits, or crowned lapwings. Their Afrikaans name is kivit, and if they call for you, and if they call for you, which they aren't going to do, you can hear why. It's an onomatopoeic term for the way they call. Beautiful orange legs, stunning birds, very common, probably highly underrated, and they are what are termed coursing birds. So in the same way that wild dogs course after their prey, so do the kivits or crowned lapwings run after their prey on the ground and then pick up insects. They've got insect-eating bills. There we go. Something just bit the dust at the beak, bright orange beak of that beautiful crowned lapwing. So what do we do in our spare time? Well, some of us try and do some exercise when we can. Um, others of us do quite a lot of sleeping. Because we have to get up very early in the morning, of course. Um, I sometimes play the guitar. I do some writing. Brian, what do you do, Brian? I mostly snooze. Brian snoozes. Brian also has to put his footage into folders and things. He has to look after that sort of stuff. The cameraman's work is never done. Two warthogs over there, two piglets. I'm sure their mother must be around. We saw them here the other day. In fact, the other day being yesterday. Two young warthogs. And as I said yesterday, they're all moving closer and closer towards the water, incurring more and more risk as they do so simply because the predators will start to predict their movements and they'll start to hang around the water as well, which will make life for these little piglets very difficult indeed. Isn't he sweet? There are two little boars. I saw them yesterday, so I know that they are both males. 
And that lovely sound that you heard there, that is known as a crested barbet. Lovely orange and yellow and black and white and red colors, but very scruffy. But otherwise, things are completely silent. And again, this is a function of the lack of water. At this time of the day, normally in summer, there's the mother, we would have quite a lot of bird song. That's Mrs. Warthog. Look after your youngsters, Mrs. Warthog. Hmm. Oh, look. They're just too sweet. And they get taken out quite a lot, you know. I hate watching a Warthog baby getting killed. I don't really enjoy anything getting killed, but... I guess the animals out here have to eat. Righty ho. There's the other few sounders of Warthog. There are two little sounders in there. We'll just try and find you a view. If I can't, we'll just carry on to the dam. Mm, can you, see, you can't really see them, can you, Brian? Uh, you might get a view here, over the top of those impala. There we go. There you can see the warthog in the background. This game drive has a remarkable reminiscence to or similarity to yesterday's. Same animals, same place, which I think is great because it means you can tell exactly what's happening with whom. Some impala. That one at the back there's just reached two years of age. He's just over two. You can see he's got his proper bend in his horns, but he's not quite there, quite and quite opened up yet. So he'll be going into his, he's probably, well, he was born in November 2014. Would that be correct? No, 2013. So he's 14, 1, 15, yes, 2013. Jennifer, a very nice question. You've noticed that the warthogs are grazing on their front knees. Now, remember, we had a long discussion yesterday about what that joint actually is. It's the equivalent of your wrist joint, but we'll call it a knee for now. They are the only animals that I know of that graze on their knees, except perhaps some of the other pigs. We get one other pig out here, although I've never seen it yet. Yeah, it's called a bush pig. And I'm, uh, I imagine that the bush pig can probably do that too. Although they're not predominantly grazers, well, they are, they do graze, but they're not predominantly grazers, they're omnivorous. They'll eat quite a lot of meat. Basically like your standard issue pig, which will eat anything you give to it. We all have friends like that, don't we, Brian? Mm. See a little bit of cloud building. There's an aeroplane coming overhead, Brian. Take cover. I always like to watch aeroplanes going overhead over the bush like this, simply because it, it gives one a feeling of the romance of an area like this. It's nice to think that you can only kind of, we're so remote that sometimes you can only fly into these areas. It isn't strictly true for here of course and I just like it makes me makes me real feel the romance of Africa you know a bit of art of Africa feel Brian doesn't look much like Meryl Streep though I don't look much like Robert Redford Brian don't worry about ah oh, there's a massive Massive activity going here. Right, there's absolutely nothing going on here at Sydney's Dam for the first time in about four weeks, possibly because I'm here. When Jamie comes here, wild dogs appear on tap. Elephants appear, everything appears. Jamie has a way with these things. There are some hippo there though. And while we're just getting a quick glimpse at the hippo before we move on, Raid Freak, you want to know about antelope meat and is there a market for it? Yeah, there is a market for it, absolutely. 
and I wish actually the market was larger than it is. To grow or to raise, say, impala for venison is far less environmentally detrimental than raising feedlots full of cattle. The, we are more and more becoming aware of how damaging the meat production, commercial meat production is for the environment, for the, for the air, for the earth, and probably for our health as well, especially given the grain-fed beef that we eat, which is not what beef is designed to eat. A grass-reared impala is a far better bet for food, much richer in protein, so you've got to eat much less of it. And there's a growing awareness of this, and so with it comes a growing demand for venison. Not in this area, of course, you can't come into an area like this and start hunting what you want to eat, but certainly there are commercial farms around the place that are raising impala and kudu and other animals like that for consumption by human beings. Right, I think we'll move on from here, Brian. Not much going on. Let's keep going. Now, we have a quick... <laughs> an inquiry from someone on Twitter who I cannot look in the eye and say her name uh, without start giggling. Your name is Anne Atilope. Anne T. Lope. Uh, you want to know what will happen to the buffalo should Sydney's dam dry up, and do I think it will dry up? Anne T. Lope. I... I still think we're going to get quite late rain. I think it's going to come. I don't think it's going to make much of a difference to the grass ward, but I do think it's going to fill up some of the water holes. If we don't, that dam will dry up probably in the next three months or so. I don't think they pump it. I'm pretty sure they don't. Unless they pump it. If they pump it, then obviously it won't dry up. But I don't think they pump it. If that does dry up, there will still be water in Biffles Hook. And James there for a moment. We've come on to Arethusa to see if maybe those lines crossed in this direction. I'm not sure what's happened. I don't know if the buffalo maybe walked on over their tracks. I don't know where those tracks went or maybe they just got obliterated by the grading machine. But I haven't seen any sign of the lines coming through. Quite nice. I showed them yesterday. Oh, okay. I showed them yesterday after our, our grading quiz. After I tested them on a very mean track, and we stopped by after a crash cut. I was right outside DRC, so I thought maybe I'd just show them what I mean by a grading machine. Two tires strung together at the back of a metal bar. I think might have been a more accurate approach. All of these buffalo are going towards. For those of you who are watching the Arethusa Dam camera at some point during the day, do you see any signs of large buffalo herds coming through? I'm just curious. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know if you did. Maybe those lions stuck behind them. Gosh, now I've got a really itchy foot. Bitten by one of those stable flies. get sorted soon, but I hear that James was at Sydney's dam and that nothing was happening there. And I've just been purely lucky. That is all it has been. I've just been at Sydney's dam at the right place at the right time. The wild dogs, just to give you an update, are somewhere on Simbabili. I've heard them called in. I'm not exactly sure where. So my next plan of action or plan of attack will be to drive up along the western boundary of Arethusa along the Murrakeni drainage line we can spot from there, drive all the way up to Simbabili on that side. I did hear tales of an elephant herd somewhere on this road. So keep your 
your eyes peel for big dark shapes, you see them. sighting of elephants playing in the water. A hot day like today would be entirely appropriate. Oh dear. Oh, there we go. Let's give her some space. Hello, big girl. How's it, girl? It's all right. It's okay. Wondering, it looks like away from the Arethusa Dam camera, which might give us a little bit of a head shake, might raise her ears at us. Hello, girlie. It's all right. Where'd you go? No problem. Stopping for a quick bite of buffalo thorn. Most of them moving away from the Arethusa Dam. I guess they've already had their drink for the afternoon. And they don't look like they've been swimming any time recently or spraying themselves with water. The rest of the herd has wandered through into this block. I don't see any more of them coming in this direction. And as she disappears, I'm gonna distract you all for a second at the family of baby Franklin that have been trying desperately to keep really still and have just popped out. They've decided that you might be not as much of a threat as they first thought. They were trying to keep really still and hide away from us. Perfect little miniatures of the adults. One, two, three, four. And there's mom. <laughs> that was a nice little surprise. Now, since I am on Arethusa, and I know that some of you have been sending through the updates about the bulls on the Arethusa Dam camera, I think that might be a nice place for us to go. I believe that James had an extraordinary sighting with them yesterday, swimming in the dam and playing around there. I think that we should make our way there, since our elephant herd has moved into quite dense vegetation. We'll leave our baby Franklins for now and go and investigate. Probably the quickest way to do that is to go back that we've just come. And while I make my way to those elephants at Arethusa Dam, I believe that James has found some other elephants to keep you company in the meantime. I thought we'd found the first elephants of the day, but we haven't apparently. Jamie found one. Of course, she did find one before me. Now oh, she's going to a couple more at Arethusa. Anyway, it's a small herd here. Most of them about to head onto Simbambili, which is just the other side there. But there's another one coming this way here. Beautiful elephant. Probably a young bull trying to sort of stay away from the rest of the herd because he's trying to assert his independence. Doesn't want to be around mum. He's calling now. He's making a very gentle rumbling call. 
He doesn't want to be around Mum for too long because, you know, it's just like, as I, as I like to say, a bit like a teenager who's at a who's at the, at the mall with his parents. He just doesn't want to be seen by, with them. Remember how that felt, Brian? No. Not, no? <laughs> oh, I do. I want to be seen to be independent. There he goes. And thank you so many, much, sorry, thank you so many for all of you, the many of you who have shared your green season photographs or screenshots of Juma in more um, verdant times. Thank you so much for sharing those with us and with the other viewers on Twitter. I think that'll give you a great idea of what this place can look like. I'm just gonna nip around here get a nice view that's not a bull that's a young cow and she looks almost pregnant I don't suppose you can be almost pregnant can you Brian Literally. you're kind of pregnant or not really it's a bit like being dead anyway she's a young cow who's pregnant and what I just trying interested by is her age I think she's a real youngster as she comes here there she comes Hello, Debbie in Vancouver. This elephant herd is very relaxed, and you wondering if the elephants are being a bit more cranky, perhaps they're not around vehicles as much as they were, or... No, Debbie, that's not the case. I think the elephants are just as relaxed as normal. And I must just reiterate here that even when they seem relaxed, we are constantly on the lookout for any signs that they might be uncomfortable. Now this is important because we want to maintain the trust that we've built up over many years of viewing elephants in this area. We're desperate to make, make sure that the elephants out here feel completely happy with our presence. And the way to do that, of course, is to respect their space and make sure that when they do say, please go away, we do go away. Small herd, one, two, three, four, just. And the only other herd of four that I know of is the one, is a female, that is her, is that her? No. A female with a sort of sawn off trunk. getting quite close. They seem to be very comfortable. They were making a little call to each other. I think the big one was probably calling. She went, oh, and they all sort of started to gather together here. And let's see what happens here. They're just going to walk past us. Beautiful, beautiful elephant cow. Isn't she lovely? We're just going to, I'm just going to be very quiet now. They're feeding very close by. And I don't want them to get a fright from my voice. Oops, I also don't want to throw things around the car. They're eating Combritum colinum, the variable bush willow. It seems to be very good elephant forage. This is fantastic. She's showing a little bit of discomfort. You see that swinging of the foot? That's a kind of displacement behavior where she's fidgeting because she doesn't feel too comfortable, but she's okay. And if we look behind us, there's another little herd of elephants. That's exact speak of the devil, as it were. That's her with the sawn off trunk. She's lost the bottom third of her trunk. And that's her little herd my favorite little herd behind us. So we've got a very close by herd here in front. Four, and 
and then the other little herd behind, that tiny, tiny little baby. I'm not going to start the car now. She's wonderfully comfortable with us, everyone. That is just very special. Beautiful. Here comes the little one now. Look at him. Sorry. Look, he's sorry. My head was in shock there. Sorry about that, everyone. Look at him just smelling us, showing us how big and strong he is. Now, the ones behind us are talking to this group, I think. Here comes the young pregnant cow. Also not uncomfortable with us. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I still don't want to move, just simply because they're so relaxed at the moment. And I, I think it might just frighten them slightly, but you know what? I'm just going to try and move 90 degrees. Thankfully, this Rusty is quite a quiet little car. So we'll just move around like this. Okay, I'm going to stop here. The little one is playing in the dust. It is just fantastic. And now playing with his siblings. I th one of those is either a sibling of the mother, or she could be, this is the cut-off trunk female, she could also be the mother of all three of them. I think most likely two of them, and the bigger one being a sibling of hers. Wonderful little herd commonly seen around here than that new one is probably only about maybe three weeks old. Tiny. And clear, she was talking to you. I, you may have heard her going, oh, and then she shook her head like that. That wasn't at the vehicle. It was at the, at the young pregnant cow that I was talking about earlier. She looked at them, obviously said something that they didn't like, and so she shook her head and said, back off. There, you can see very clearly now that she's pregnant. You see that great bulge in her stomach, the top underneath her spine there. It's going to be a small elephant very soon, I think. And then the, other, the others are in this thicket just in front of us here. And they're standing in the shade, just enjoying some more Combritum collinum, the variable bush willow. It seems to be a really good drought forage. And that little one probably about uh, maybe 14 months old or so. No, no, not even that. Just under a year. And you can see, even now, at that age, very confident. Right, I'm going to stay right where I am for the next little while. Let's head across to Jamie. She's got one of those behemoth bulls swimming at Arethusa Dam. I'll see you here just now. Well, most likely, the three behemoth bulls that James had yesterday afternoon, one of which, I believe, came right up to say hello to him and Andrew. There's one of them who's just gone out of the dam, and then there's two bulls on the other side. The one on the right looks particularly large, and there's one buffalo that's also enjoying what's left of the Arethusa Dam. I must have been, I got quite a shock. I haven't been to the Arethusa Dam in a while, and there's hardly any water. This came as quite a surprise. It's amazing how rapidly what's been left has evaporated. It's still suitable for these lovely bull elephants to come and have a bit of a dip. As I mentioned earlier, or this morning actually, 
we've started with this drought to see more and more of these big elephant bulls. He's looking, is he going to look for something to eat or is he going to have a dust bath? Resting his trunk on the ground. And just, well, we have a view of a bird that Karen asked about earlier on in the drive. Just wanted to show you quickly, Karen. You chatted about marabou storks and I mentioned how incredibly unattractive they are. Well, there's one looking not so unattractive in silhouette, probably because we can't see the clearest detail of its face, perched on. Oh, James's elephants are doing something interesting. We're live, we're live. Um, elephant there just pushed over that tree. It's actually for some granata tree. I think what she was doing actually is moving it out of the way of the cumbretum that she's trying to get at. Now, what I'm going to do is just move slightly so we can get a better view of the full extent of the number of elephants that we have here. There we go. Now we can see exactly what's going on. Beautiful young cow here, probably her first pregnancy. Hopefully a successful one. Off to the right-hand side, the other small group of four with the chopped trunk, or half trunk, shall we call her, third trunk. Her little baby, possibly her sibling, and then her other youngster. Now, what you won't notice from this, of course, is that the size difference between these elephants and that enormous elephant bull that is at with Jamie is probably twice the size of these ones. So let's head straight back to him. Now, bull is tiptoeing daintily along quite a thin and sloped path, like the edge of the Arethusa Dam wall. It's amazing how incredibly nimble these elephants can be despite their size. I've heard people saying that elephants can't really climb and they can't really wander up hills and avoid rocky areas. I found elephant dung on the most random of places, right up on the top of what we term copies, looking little rocky mountainous outcrops. And they wandered their way up there. Essentially, an elephant can get anywhere a human being can get without having to use ropes or climb. But anywhere that we can go on our two feet, the elephant will most likely be capable of wandering. He is definitely taking it easy. And I agree, I have exactly the same fascination that Kay has with the way that elephants walk. The way that they place their feet and the way that that spongy cushioning spreads out as the weight comes down, more on their way. Also coming to have a drink. Somewhat tentatively, interestingly. Very slow and tentative approach to the dam. And there is another marabou stalk for Karen. Just chatting about the birds that are scavengers. This one, you can see a little bit more clearly what I meant when I said that they were ugly. I wasn't being horrible. They're bald. Look at this elephant looking at the marabou. <laughs> We've spoken a lot about the tendency of elephants to not always appreciate the company of the smaller animals in their space. They chase wild dogs, they chase impala, and particularly now feeling a bit stressed out due to the drought. And this bull, not quite sure about his approach. Our two behemoths checking each other out. Come on, boy. Are you feeling a bit intimidated? Let's see how this 
situation plays out. We've reached a something of a standoff with one water buck wandering straight into the middle. I just saw her disappear behind the bush. So the elephant on the left closely observing. The bull on the right. The social dynamics are incredible to witness. Yeah, there's water buck emerging. Going up to say hello. Interesting. Very tentative approach between the two of them. You can be almost certain that they know each other at some point. There goes the marabou flying up to join the other. Well done, Brent. Awesome. Watching the way that they are perched on top of that rather precarious dead tree perch. Any fowls making a racket as well. There we go. Acceptance, the smaller bull is now being complete, has been completely ignored by the larger gentleman. Oh, what do we have here? Speaking about chasing away smaller animals, they've now approached this buffalo bull who looks still relaxed, but not entirely contented with the situation. Elephants are after water weeds, and water hyacinths that have been growing in this dam. I'm just going to find out what those guinea fowl are shouting at. They are alarm calling. I did see them earlier when we drove in. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that a leopard has revealed itself to me through the alarm calls of guinea fowl. What's got them dashing about like that? I don't see any birds of prey. I think that will be my next place to go and investigate. The Egyptian geese just off to the right haven't paid too much attention. Oh, the monkeys are running through. They've got small chicks, it could be the monkey. Yeah, it could be, that's a very good point. So Brent's raised a good point, that if the guinea fowl, and they should be, they, it's a, there's a very good chance that guinea fowl have babies at the moment, or chicks wandering around with them. At that point, monkeys do become a bit more of a threat. A monkey would not tackle. There's more of them now flying onto the damn wall. The Egyptian geese aren't alarm calling. But yes, a monkey wouldn't necessarily take on an adult guinea fowl, but they are certainly, as omnivores, not above tackling a chick and grabbing a chick away from an unsuspecting parent. It is what's happening. The monkeys are chasing them. Distraction all around the dam. That monkey just very briefly chased the guinea fowl away. Whether that's through playfulness or because if they they might have babies monkeys might choose to target oh it's all happening yeah <laughs> everything happening at once <laughs> the buffalo bull has decided he's not entirely happy with the company he was keeping at the dam he thought maybe it would be a sensible move and i agree with him to wander off to a slightly different patch of mud not easy navigation that mud is incredibly thick and sticky. Now, the fact that I said it was a sensible decision is the answer to the hacker's question. The hacker sent through, will elephants ever attack buffalo? And yes, there are recorded cases, and, and there have been at least two that I can think of that were witnessed and photographed in the last few months of elephants attacking, in one case, a young buffalo bull. In another case, it was a buffalo cow. I believe. And both times the buffaloes were actually speared and killed 
in the attack. Uh, it's something that we're going to start seeing more and more frequently as animals become under more pressure from the drought and competition for water, for access to water, becomes fairly fierce. And elephants are grumpy. They don't like to share their water sources. Well, they can be grumpy at, any, at some point. And I mentioned earlier that they will chase away the little animals like wild dogs and impala and even water buck at times. Look at how this poor buffalo bull is struggling. I can't tell if it's because that mud is so thick and sticky or if it's got a limp as well. I think it's just because that mud is so difficult to navigate through. Shame, displaced from his afternoon napping area. It's also not unheard of for animals to get stuck in mud like this. Less common with the larger creatures like the buffalo, but even then, it does occur occasionally. Well done, buffalo. Managed to escape the elephants. Definitely not worth tackling a bull of this size. Well, he does look perfectly at peace. He didn't really show all that much aggression towards the buffalo. He was just after food around the spot where the buffalo was lying down. It was interesting watching the interaction of that bull that came in and then wandered off with one of the trio, moved into a different area. And we see some tremendously entertaining interactions between the different elephants. But a mine was wondering, do elephants ever mark their territories? And they don't, and the reason behind that is that elephants don't actually have territories. It's marabou going to soar across the skies. Awesome. Enormous wingspans. One of the largest birds that we actually have out here in the Sabi Sands. And one, despite its ugly appearance, that has come under threat in recent years, just like the vultures, particularly due to poisoning of carcasses. So nice to see them wandering through. Here comes our buffalo gentleman. It was just sticky mud that he was struggling through. Shame, boy. Your mud, your date at the spa is done. It's time for you to move away. The elephants have pushed him out. And the water holes at the moment are just pumping with action. There's even, I thought I saw a bush buck, but I think it might have moved off. I've seen the Nyala that are wandering around. Oh, that one there, yes. Let's see when it turns. munching away at the green grass of the seat line. No more alarm calls from the guinea fowl. They've relaxed a bit. I think it was, it was definitely the monkeys. The monkeys were tormenting them, chasing them around a bit. Always worthwhile following alarm calls of guinea fowl, if you hear them, particularly when they sound incredibly frantic. As I said earlier, they have led me to spectacular leopard sightings before. And Brent giving us a lovely overview of all of the animals around the dam, including this waterbuck male, two waterbuck bulls, that are awaiting their chance to come down and enjoy the dam. Now oh, this group of water buck, there's a couple of large males and there's quite a few females as well. The females have moved into the denser vegetation, but we see them pretty much every time we come around the Arathusa Dam. Three males that I counted. And they're starting to wander down into the clearing. Beautiful large bulls. Oh, 
uh, bulls have had a very relaxed approach to this afternoon's time spent in the dam and in the mud. And Rudy wanted to know, we've seen them moving about this entire afternoon. When do elephants sleep? Do we know when elephants sleep? And they sleep at various times throughout the day and evening, usually fairly short bursts. But believe it or not, Rudy, even a large bull elephant such as this one can occasionally, might occasionally, actually lie down to sleep. And I think he's going to go walking along towards the dam wall. I'm just going to reposition to get us a little bit closer to him, to where he's going to pop out on the road. Rudy, even a large bull such as this can lie down for a short period of time. Quite often they'll choose to lie against the banks of a termite mound, maybe against a tree, just to make the process of getting up a little bit easier. Awesome to watch. And just that gentle, slow step is capable of eating up the miles when they decide to focus their attentions and go in one direction. The calves, Rudy, will sleep more often than the adults do, just like children in human beings. The more growing they have to do, the more sleep that they need. And they don't need to feed as constantly as the adults either because they've got access to mom's milk. Which way are these Ellie's going to decide to go? I think they might even pop onto the damn wall. wander along that, are they going to wander along that narrow path? Or are they going to make their way up over the dam wall? I was talking about, sorry, let me finish off my sentence and my answer to Rudy's question about elephants sleeping. If they're not lying down, they very often doze for a couple of minutes at a time on their feet. And they'll, it's very common to see, particularly with large bulls, like the one that we have and some of the elephants that we have here, they quite often rest their heads on the fork of a tree or rest their heads against a marula. Very entertaining to watch an elephant in a deep, relaxed state. And they can sleep incredibly well. I've encountered elephants fast asleep in the bush before, whilst on foot, that have not even stirred as I've walked past them. They have not even been aware of my presence. There we go, it's swimming time. This is awesome. Right down chest deep. It's not uncommon for elephants to submerge themselves completely when they have the opportunity. Unfortunately, the Arethusa Dam is no longer deep enough for such games. When I first started working here, we had a wonderful sighting with a buffalo bull, uh, sorry, with an elephant bull in Buffelshook Dam that submerged himself, was rolling over in the water. They are actually quite fairly capable swimmers. At the moment though, they're taking the opportunity to stretch out and grab some of the juiciest plants. And cooling down at the same time. Much to the displeasure on the right of the African jacana, that's just to the right of where that elephant is. Here it is. Dodging and diving. You hear them sloshing through the water. Now I know that I'm not alone in the fact that I really truly enjoy a big elephant bull sighting. And Kelly who's watching on Twitter. Kelly was wondering, do I prefer male elephant sighting or female elephant sightings? Or is every sighting just a little bit different? It's a, oh, I'm trying to think what my best answer for this question is, Kelly. I would say on foot, definitely, there's nothing like a large elephant bull. They tend to be particularly relaxed, far more relaxed than the breeding herds are. 
You've got less chance of finding yourself with an elephant suddenly behind you or on the side with elephant with male elephants just because they move about generally on their own or in small bachelor groups. So on foot I would say elephant bulls and probably if I really had to choose I guess I'd say in the vehicle I also enjoy elephant bull sightings. The young ones tend to be either playful or entertaining whilst the more mature gentlemen of 20 and over are beautifully relaxed and very often comfortably come across to the car to investigate and have a look at you. But Kelly, there's also again nothing more entertaining than a breeding herd with youngsters and baby elephants at any age can be hugely entertaining. Water buck wandering into the water as well. The rest of the herd is going to be coming down shortly to join him. The first brave trailblazer picking the opposite side of the dam to the elephants. And there's the one, I've only seen that one hippo remaining in Arethusa Dam. There could be more. I've only seen this one. Most of them have moved off to the larger dams, possibly up towards Sydney's dam as well. And we've spoken before about the fact that they are being actively removed from the northern Sabi sands just because of this serious drought and the lack of space and water for them. Hello boys. You can see how the younger bull, the one on the right, the slightly smaller one, has reacted more to our presence, not in a huge way, not in an overly aggressive or nervous way, but he's certainly given us more of a reaction than the older bull that's on the left. Every now and again he just casts a sideways glance at us, sweeps his head from side to side. And apparently it was this bull that was the same with James yesterday afternoon in the way that he approached it. And that's sort of what I meant when I said the older males tend to be a bit more comfortable in every kind of scenario. He is gorgeous. That sunken temporal region, I would say 40 plus in terms of age. So he's been there, done that, seen safari vehicles come and go throughout his entire lifetime. All kinds of memories in that brain. Well, personally, I find whenever elephants walk up to the vehicle and they have a good look at you, I always find there's a difference to looking into an elephant's eyes than any other animal. That's just my personal feeling about them. Definitely something looking back at you. And the water back making their way in. There's even some youngsters, one little calf that's the size of the Impala ram that it's feeding next to. And the females delicately picking their way through the mud. Not an easy feat if you've got slightly sharper and big hooves. I see you, boy. I see you. What's up, big boy? It's okay. We're not doing anything to you. You're very big and scary, yes. But I've been sitting here the whole time. There's no aggression there from that elephant. Just keeping an eye on us. gentleman is completely unconcerned and how spectacular is that dust blowing in the sunset beautiful image well, we've spoken before about the fact that the breeding herds at the moment are a little bit unsettled and the fact that 
it might have something to do with the presence of some of the larger males that have been seen with them more often than they have in the past, at least from my time at the start of my time at Juma, which was around July last year. And Tony was wondering, would a big male elephant ever kill a calf? Would the mother be able to protect it? And if it did happen, if a mother did lose its calf, look at the way it's scooping that sand up. Sorry, Tony, I'll be with you one second. It just always fascinates me the way that the multiple uses that they can put their trunks to, including scooping up trunkfuls of sand. The next part of Tony's question was, would an elephant cow come straight back into season, Ooh, ankle scratch, uh, in the same way a leopard or a lion might do? Hello, boy. He is stunning. He is going to come up a little bit closer to say hello, I think. Again, no aggression. He's just letting me know that he's much bigger than I am. And he is. Hello, boy. So interesting to see the difference in his tusks this elephant. The longer, thinner and pointier left one versus the thicker and more blunt right tusk. A perfect example of the slave and the master tusks. One tusk that is used more frequently than the other. What's interesting about this elephant is it looks as though, judging from the way in which the groove runs along his left-hand tusks, and yes, the right-hand tusk is shorter. Looks as though he breaks plants, which is what causes that groove in the tusk itself. And he breaks plants off with his left tusk, and he probably uses his right tusk more for digging. And we've spoken a lot about elephants being, the possibility of elephants being left and right-handed, and I've suggested in the past that I don't think it is as pronounced in all elephants as we necessarily think it is. But there is definitely a, dif a difference for some elephants as to what they use their tusks for. And interesting how his genetics have given him a thicker right tusk and a thinner left tusk. I just got distracted with him walking across in front of us. But I was in the middle of answering Tony's question about whether or not a male elephant will ever kill a calf. Tony does happen. It's quite an unusual situation. Um, and again, there's usually some kind of explanation behind it. Very seldom does a calf get crushed. What might happen is where a bull is interested in a female and the calf comes between them, he might decide that he really doesn't appreciate the presence of the calf. That happens with all mammal species that get protective over the female that they're going to be mating with. It does occur, and yes, the female will come back into estrus, not necessarily as fast as one of the cat species. That's a product of the gap between the estrus cycles. There's a difference between elephants and cats. Cats have a much shorter gap between their estrus cycles if they're not pregnant. And they've also got much shorter gestation periods. But a female, if she does lose her calf for any kind of reason, will start coming back into estrus in the next few months. You can see how he's clearly the dominant in this situation. All the other elephants moving out of his way. Well, Arethusa Dam has, I think, provided us with some spectacular scenes this afternoon, and we have certainly made the most of them. I want to go and investigate the Murakini drainage line, find out what's happening there. And before I do, just a quick update. I did mention that the wild dogs were on Simobili, but that I wasn't able to hear exactly where they were. But we'll keep an ear out on the radio and I'll keep you updated if we hear any chance of them coming back either down into Arethusa or back across to the east towards Juma and Sydney's Dam. And while I go and investigate that, let's pop over to James for an update. 
Right, so we've come back to Sydney's dam. We did a loop around where the wild dogs went into Simbambili. Clearly, Jamie's just got a great update about what they're doing. There is now a giant herd of elephants, and by this time, meantime, I do mean giant, herd of elephants at the dam having a drink. Definitely going to be worth just stopping, having a quick look here as the sun goes behind this lying cloud in front of us. No rain is going to come of it, I can tell. And a herd of buffalo also moving off over the dam wall. They've clearly just had a drink here as well. That's a big herd of elephants for this area. Look at that. That is spectacular. Wow. Isn't that nice? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen or so. It's not that massive, I suppose, but it is quite a big herd. Bigger than the four and four that we saw recently. Perfect time for them to be having a drink, of course. Perfect time for everybody to be having a drink. Just after six o'clock or just before six o'clock. Wonderful little ones, cows, calves. <laughs> oh, now what are they upset about here? Look how they've turned round. They're facing something. Let's wait right here and see what happens. Oh, Kelly, while we're waiting, you're on Twitter, and interestingly, you asked Jamie, do I prefer male or female elephant sightings, or does it, you know, are they all different and does it not make any difference? I'll have to go with the latter there, Kelly. I think it really depends on the sighting. I've had some wonderful herd sightings where, you know, females and youngsters are all around the vehicle paying me no attention whatsoever. But a massive bull sighting like that, sighting that Jamie's just had, they are so huge and you won't get quite the same impression that you do seeing them live. They are so massive that they are breathtaking. And to see an old bull like that and two old bulls like that especially is just a breathtaking experience. But to see a tiny baby elephant newborn with its mother totally relaxed around us is equally as breathtaking. So it really does just depend on the situation. Something is going on here. They've smelt something or they've seen something. You can see the one on the far left has lifted her head up, opened her ears out. She seems to be, st she's still not happy. It might just be that they're unfamiliar with each other. You know, such a big herd might be just like the others. They might not be the same herd. They might not live together all the time. Maybe they've caught wind of the other pack of dogs, the Investec pack. Maybe they've spotted a crocodile that's in the water there. It's quite possible that there could be a crocodile there. You can, you know, they wouldn't be probably wading across there, the youngsters. Well, they wouldn't be in any danger from a crocodile. I'm going to reverse slightly. The female on the far left, Brian, has just got her, her ears right up. see if she can't see something. Maybe a leopard, maybe some lions, maybe a hyena. No, I don't see anything in front of her there. Simply moving off towards where their ears were open. Wild dogs, of course, wouldn't stop them. There's some water back there, yeah. Normally react like that to water back, but perhaps because everything is so sort of water stressed, they don't want anything else to drink their meager water resources. That's possible. Now, the water back have skedaddled off, haven't they? So I was mentioning crocodiles, and it's possible that a crocodile could live in a water hole like this, especially when the water is so 
sort of low in the rivers. I think I can actually see a crocodile, Brian. I might be quite wrong. Can you see the hole at the far end there? Far right hand side, you can see a hole in the bank. That's it. Right, now if you zoom in on that, there. Can you see in front there? Drop it there, that's it. What do you think? Yeah. I think that's a little crocodile, everyone. Now, it's just a wonderful, wonderful example of why, even if you have never seen a crocodile in a water hole here, you do not go swimming here ever because one of those beastly reptiles will come from nowhere. You will suddenly find it in your water hole, in your swimming pool, there, and it's gone under the water. Now, should you decide to do some lengths in there, it would be the very last lengths you ever did. Now, that's purely a function of the fact that the rivers are drying out. It's not a hip. Not a hippo, is it? No, it's a croc. Crocodilo. Huh. Oh, and there's the hippo lifting his, doing his bit of a yawn behind there. When I tell Leo Smith that I've seen a crocodile in here and he hasn't, he will either tell me that he knew it was here or he will deny. He will say that's impossible. Can't wait to tell him. In fact, I'm gonna ask Jerry to tell Jamie right now so that she can tell Brent. Ha 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 Apparently they, apparently they're pretending not to hear the radio on Arethusa. How convenient. So I was saying a little bit earlier that I didn't think that this dam was pumped. That said, there is a pan to the left-hand side there, where the, which you would have seen when the, you were the water buck were just behind it. Now, that pan is very clearly pumped. It might be pumped from the dam, but I suspect it's pumped from a water hole with very clean water. And the overspill from that, of course, will go into the dam. That won't be a lot. And it won't be enough to keep the dam full, I don't think. Unconfirmed, although Brent has seen him and he thinks he's enormous. Might even have been bigger than it. What is it? The Campan male. Campan male. Yeah. Definitely bigger. Says Brent. I'm still waiting for my opportunity to see him and get to experience that. I'm excited. It will happen one day. It could even be this evening. This is one of the areas this used to be sort of the line in the sand that was drawn between Tingana and the Anderson male, the two big dominant male leopards in this area. Our marabou stalks have moved across in this direction. They would have spent the day practicing what's known as Eurothermio regulation, which is basically they poop on their legs and it cools them down. It's why they often you'll see with most of the stalk species on hot days their legs are coated with white. The kidneys working hard to conserve water. That's still an interesting method, an interesting approach to coping with Africa's summer heat. It seems as though James has fixed his camera, sorted things out, 
So let's uh, pop back over there and find out what was happening with those elephants at Sydney's Dam. Sorry about that. Bit of camera trouble. Elephants now leaving the dam. But coming towards us, which is quite exciting. I'm not sure they'll come all the way across this clearing, but let's watch what happens. Now, there was a question there about wagging tails on elephants and whether or not that indicates some kind of mood. And that was from Mandy and Julia, all the way from the west coast of the United States of America in Los Angeles, city of angels. And you want to know about whether the tail swinging on an elephant means anything about its mood. Mandy, I would, and L Lorraine, I would say almost certainly not. I would say it's probably entirely to do with how many flies they have on their backs. That's basically what that tail is for. It's used to swat flies and things off the skin when they irritate the skin. It's got a long piece of hair on the back, like a really sort of, a, well, it's quite a sparse fl fly swatter, I guess probably quite effective, very coarse hairs on the edge of the tail there, and its predominant role is as a parasite remover. Do you see that elephant trip there, Brian? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Beautiful, beautiful, peaceful herd. And again, I said this before, and I'll probably say it another 150 times, but the bird song this year is very much quieter than it would be normally. It's like, you know what it's like? It's like if you're listening to an orchestra and instead of having eight first violins and eight second violins and 16 violas and, you know, an enormous brass section, it's like you've taken sort of two-thirds of each section of the orchestra away. So you've got the full, you've got the full kind of texture of the orchestra, but it's just much more subdued. Got all the different kinds of birds, but they're just a lot quieter than they would be normally, and not as many of them calling. Now, our old friend, Mr. Moustache, who seems to bob about the place like a cork in a hurricane. You were in Iceland a little while back, then you were in where were you? Then you were in Michigan. Now you're in Minnesota, Mr. Moustache. You must be absolutely exhausted. And you want to know what, what age it is that an elephant will have its first calf. An elephant will, could conceivably fall pregnant for the first time at around nine years of age. Now, given the gestation period, there's some buffalo in the background there. Let's watch out for the crocodile. He wouldn't try and take one of them but they'd get a fright if he popped his head out of the water. Given a gestation period of 22 months, Mr. Moustache, the birth, earliest birth normally for an elephant is probably around 11. It's not unusual for them to wait much longer than that, though. Now, we keep seeing these little fragments of buffalo herds. That's a tiny buffalo herd, and I suspect it's a function of them being scattered by the lions that have been around the place of late. Ah, question from a long-time viewer, Emily Wallington in Greenside, Johannesburg, very beautiful leafy suburb where there is perhaps a storm brewing as we speak on this Friday afternoon. You want to know why there is a hole at the back end of the dam wall here? Is there something living in there? Um, Emily, I think given the level of the dam, that it is highly unlikely there's anything living in there. It could have been used perhaps as a burrow by a crocodile, you know, to lay some eggs in. But of course, that would only have happened as the dam level went down. So I don't know that there's anything in there at the moment. I'm not sure. It definitely looks like it's been excavated. It could have been excavated, of course, recently by an artvark or something like that, and then made larger by a warthog because the dam level, of course, has been down around about this for about three weeks now. So it's probably quite dry in there, but not a very clever place to make a home. Thank you for your question, Emily. 
I hope Johannesburg is uh, marvellous this evening. There's a buffalo coming across the dam wall. Right, Sarah, you're in North Carolina, where crocodiles are obviously not thick on the ground. You probably have the odd alligator lurking about the place. I know your southern neighbours have definitely got plenty of alligators there. You want to know how long or how far a crocodile would have to have travelled to get into this dam from the rivers. Sarah, the nearest flowing river at the moment is the Sabi River, and that is probably, as the crow flies now, almost 25 kilometres. So in miles, that would be, ooh, shall we say, roughly 15 miles down to the Sabi River. So that's quite far, but a crocodile can walk up to 50 kilometers. So, you know, more than twice that distance, up to sort of 25, 28 miles, if it has to move between water points. And I suspect that's what this one has done. It has disappeared now, after the attentions of the hippo that's just near the buffalo there. I think that crocodile has thought better of being there. And I'm getting a word from the final control that they think the crocodile that I spotted could perhaps be that hippo. Brian, what do you think? I say nay. I say nay as well, I'm afraid. And that's not just pride speaking. I'm pretty sure that that was a crocodile, just from its shape and its general sort of activity level. Hippo, of course, if they see a crocodile like that, will go and investigate and chase it away. And James Taylor, you're on Twitter and you're backing the final control. James, this is obviously the last time I will ever answer a question from you. Sorry about that. I am joking, don't worry, James. I will still answer questions from you. I am deeply hurt, though. <laughs> and Gerda, you say, if there isn't a crocodile in here, we will have crocodile cheers of joy. Brent Leo Smith. <laughs> yes, we will. We'll also never hear the end of it. So please don't tell him, anyone. I'm still pretty sure that we did see a croc. I don't think that was the same hippo. It wouldn't be un unheard of to see a crocodile in a dam like this. Right, the elephants are moving off. We are going to do the same. We're probably going to head down towards... Mm, I haven't decided quite yet whether we should go to the hyena den or make our way to quarantine in the hopes that the wild dogs will come out of Simbambalai and perhaps head down there. I will make up my mind eventually, but while I'm doing that and prevaricating, let's head across to Jamie and Brent, see what they're doing, and I'll catch up with you just now. While James decides which direction he's going to take next on Juba, and chats a little bit about that crocodile that you saw, I'm deciding, or trying to make sure that I don't go wandering off Arathusa property itself. I always get a little bit confused in this northwestern corner of the elephant roadblock. I'm not even going to think about moving the silver cluster leaf tree. I don't even want to talk about it. It's a traumatizing experience. I'm not going to repeat it. Everybody duck. Unscathed around that tree. Hello, Impala. A couple of ears that still look a bit pregnant to me. In fact, I think that one might still be. She's just one behind the bush. Where did she go? I think moving off a little bit further up towards the weeping wattle. So a couple of still pregnant ewes in this area. There she is. And some late impala lambs are due. So for new viewers, something worth sticking around for, apart from just all of the general wonderful aspects of our live safaris, you could be seeing some brand new impala lambs. I've seen two recently around Juma. 
last few babies coming through, the final sort of birthing climax, and then back to preparing for May's rut, where the males start to compete and chase the females around. It's a highly entertaining, it's probably the noisiest that the impala ever are. Very vocal at that time of year. Friends, out of curiosity. Boundary road. Well, that's good. That's 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 definitely a positive. That is where I want to be. Hmm? Towards boundary pan. This is wonderful news. I got a new phone and I lost my Arethusa map. And most of our regular viewers will know that I'm never lost exactly on Arethusa. It's just sometimes I don't know exactly entirely where I am or at least the name of the road that I'm driving on. Useful to have Brent on the back. Interestingly enough, traveling along this western edge, it's very clear how much more rain they've had around here. along and of course we chat about dung that we encounter fairly regularly. We often stop and move around fresh piles of dung to avoid squashing any dung beetles that might be in them, might have taken up residence. Eric who's watching in Virginia Beach would like to know since there is so much of the dung lying around and being utilized, not necessarily utilized particularly at the moment of the drought by as many dung beetles as we might see in the wetter seasons. Are there any uses that the local people can put the dung to? For example, insulation or fuel. Now the first thing that springs immediately to mind, and Eric, I don't know if you ever watched some of these drives with Steph. It was quite a while ago, it was a good couple of months ago, where Steph constructed a coffee tin with some holes in it, and he put elephant dung in and burnt it in order to ward off the flies. Now, I question how effective that really was. He certainly hasn't tried it again recently, although Steph seems to be particularly bothered by flies for some reason. I haven't seen him do it recently. I don't know how effective it was in the end. It certainly didn't seem to have any positive effects. And I'm going to head back across to the east. Yeah, I see them. One impala dashing madly across the road. Could it be the dogs have come through again? I'm just going to try and get that update from Tristan. Tristan, what are those position of those madash? Copy that, thanks. We just saw some marlas sprinting by. We're just wondering if it might have been them. No sign. Wonder what it was that spooked those impala. I don't see anything coming through. There's no alarm calls. Could be one of the males. And as we watch that impala sprint past, look at their general body language as we go along, which direction they're looking in. They don't seem to be looking back to where that impala sprinted from. That high speed race, Pat was wondering how fast an impala can run, and Pat, the answer is around the region of about a 50 to 60 kilometer speed, probably up to 70 at top speed, that's miles would be between 25 to close to 30 or just over 30 miles an hour. Very, very rapid. 
again, it's one of those interesting things. They can probably outrun something like a lion or a cheetah, or lion or a leopard, or even a cheetah, by maintaining those speeds and exhibiting a bit more stamina than those big cats might have. There's a lovely kudu bull in here, but he's hiding away in quite dense vegetation. I don't think we're going to get a nice view of him. Wild dogs, on the other hand, and we saw those wild dogs sprinting after the impala. Let's go and have a look if they're looking off. They also look to be on alert. There we go. This off-road track has been blocked through into this open space. I'm just listening to the radio updates at the same time. I got an update from Tristan and I heard I wanted to just get that update from him as to where the wild dogs are. They're still on Simbombili and actually quite far from where we are now. It definitely wasn't that particular pack of wild dogs chasing Impala. You never know though. Here yeah, could you come around the back of the termite mounds. Accompanied by the sound of the emerald spotted wood dove. And speaking about local beliefs and local uses, there's a traditional belief that it's bad luck to listen to the entire call of the emerald spotted wood dove. Lovely, beautiful little dove with, believe it or not, emerald spots on its back. Oh, and speaking of traditional uses, Eric, I wasn't actually finished answering your question about elephant dung or various types of dung. To the best of my knowledge, it's not used as any type of insulation. I can't think of it ever having been used in that particular case. And it's not really burnt as fuel, per se, but it is used to start fires. It can be used as kindling. Obviously, it has to be dry elephant dung. And there's also some beliefs that it will help to cure a head cold or get rid of a headache if you sniff it and that in that particular instance I have tried that I've tried burning elephant dung when I've had a headache and a cold and sniffed it to see if it will help me at all all it ended up doing was giving me more of a headache but maybe I just put the wrong pile of elephant dung it's not necessarily that far-fetched to imagine that it could work in that way if you think about it there are trees out here. We've discussed multiple examples. Goodness, the elephants have been through here. Creating roadblocks. Yes, there are certain types of trees with painkiller properties. For example, the sickle bush bark, the boar bean bark. Types of tree that haven't have been proven to have nice medicinal benefits. And of course, if you hark back to the invention of the aspirin, it stems from concoctions imitating the bark of a willow tree. At this point, as far as I know, most aspirin is artificially produced, but it's it has its origins in the pain-killing properties of willow tree bark. Elephant dung could, in theory, work the same if you get the right pile of elephant dung. An elephant that's eaten those plants with those properties. I think we might knock the antenna here. I want to knock Jigger's antenna off as well. I'm trying to think if there's any other traditional beliefs relating to dung. And Eric, I believe it was Eric who suggested the dung, I know it was Eric, who suggested the dung recognition challenge. He wanted to, and I don't know if I even mentioned it to Brent, he wanted to blindfold us, or have us blindfolded, and then test each dung, see if we can identify the different types of dung. I'm pretty sure we could manage all of them. Many really of Eric tastes the dung first. <laughs> that was originally his suggestion as well. He suggested a taste or feel test, at which point I demonstrated the spitting of impala dung or whatever particular dung might be your preference. I, I, I think spitting impala dung is part of the game. It's probably the best way forward. And quite aerodynamically shaped. The aim of that particular game is to spit dung 
as far as possible and beat whoever you are competing against. I happen to be not so good at it. I somehow imagine Brent is highly successful at that particular game. Three meters, really? That's impressive. World, world record. What is the world record? Eleven and eleven is the change. Eleven meters? No way. That's in, that's ridiculous. Eleven meters, that's about thirty-three feet that somebody managed to spit a piece of a piece of impala poo. Now when Brent and myself grew up as children in South Africa, this was one of the games that we played and it was met with some disapproval from certain spheres, but it was just something we were raised doing. Neither of us have suffered any ill effects. You don't necessarily swallow the dung, although sometimes it does happen by mistake, particularly if you get overly enthusiastic and you take a deep breath in to expel the dung as far as possible. And you usually try and pick the nice dry pieces that aren't fresh and sticky. So essentially, all you're doing really is eating a little bit of dirt. That is bok drawl spoof, another traditional use for dung. And if you haven't played dodgeball with elephant dung before in a riverbed or something like that, which is essentially just dodgeball but with dung, then you're definitely missing out on one of life's greatest pleasures. And I've just seen some fresh dung and Brent has spotted the elephants responsible for leaving the dung that we've just been chatting about. In a very, very dense block, I'm going to reposition so we can get a better view. I just wanted to show you what we were looking at. I think I'm gonna try and loop around. There's a road that runs just to the south of where they are might be our best approach. And generally when you go crunching after elephants, if you're going through thick vegetation, they tend to move off ahead of you. So obviously we try not to off-road after them unless we've got a nice clear open space to make it nice and easy. This road does loop around and it should get us some better views. Even the rest of the herd as well. places must be actually absolutely stunning. In rainy season, there's some beautiful pans in this area. While I try to get a view of these elephants, let's have a look at the, from the biggest to the tiniest little creature. Let's see what James has found. I suppose the tiniest little creature out here might be considered some sort of protozoan or bacterium found inside the gut of this very tiny little carnivore called a dwarf mongoose. And if you are a new viewer, I know there are a few of you watching today, this is Africa's smallest carnivore. So it looks like a little rat. He's not in fact related to rats at all, rather more closely related to things like hyenas or the mongoose. And quintessentially look at it standing there exactly like a Brian meerkat exactly just like a meerkat which I'm sure many of you have seen on the TV very closely related same family so sweet and this is the smallest example of mongoose that we get here the other social ones we get are called the banded mongoose and then we get a slender mongoose which is a bit bigger and lives in pairs or alone and then also a white-tailed mongoose, which is a big mongoose species that is nocturnal. The larger they get, the more alone they seem to be. Look at that, isn't that sweet? And they keep very genteel hours. They're not night owls. They don't get up early, so they'll, this will be their home. They'll be living in this termite mound. This is an old disused termite mound, well, disused by termites, well used by trees and grasses, uh, possibly snakes, and definitely the odd warthog has lived here at, <coughs> excuse me, one time or the other, and now it is home to this little troop of dwarf mongoose. Beautiful. So when I say they keep, there's something dive bombing there, Brian, I'm just gonna go forward a bit. There are hornbills and, and drongos dive-bombing something in the ground there. I wonder if they aren't dive-bombing either the mongoose. 
see the hundle on the ground there? It was bombing something. There, beautiful yellow billed hornbill. He's got, got something, he had something in his beak. Has he got something in his beak there? No. What a stunning shot of that bird sitting on what is known as a buffalo thorn. You can see a little breeze blowing up from the southeast. And again, a very quiet, quiet end to the day. There's also a magpie shrike that seems to be missing its tail there. They've normally got a slightly longer tail than that. Definitely missing a piece of it, possibly just a juvenile, having just fledged. And they're communal nesting birds. They live in a little flock. That one is making quite a juvenile noise, as if to say, where are the rest of you? I'm all alone here. There, that's the normal call, that beautiful plaintive whistle. You know what they were bombing? Brian, they were bombing the mongoose. See, the mongoose are now on the floor. They're just exactly where that, where that hornbill was. Look at them there, they're foraging there. And Chris Applegate, yes, very nice comment. You say they look like ferrets. Now, if I'm not mistaken, a ferret is more closely related to a weasel, and a weasel is in a slightly different family from the mongoose. But yes, they do look like ferrets. I wonder if there aren't some harvested termites there that they might be eating. Perhaps a scorpion burrow that they're excavating. They will love to eat scorpions. I'm just looking at Brian for Mike's question. Mike, you're in Florida, and you want to know if these dwarf mongoose have got similar noses to meerkats. Brian sort of indicates yes a little bit. Brian, of course, filmed meerkats extensively, and so he knows them very well. Quite similar. They're the same family. I mean, they're just a different genus of the same family. See them all here. They're all quite close by now, and there's a drongo coming in. They're all still foraging here. It's quite late for them to be out. They won't be out after dark. They like to be inside the mound by the time it gets dark. And they'll only come out again when the sun touches the surface. There's the drongo. When the sun touches the surface of the mound. Isn't he a beautiful bird? They often come to the ground at this time of the night. I'm not sure why. When I used to live up near a place called Palaboa, I used to go running in the late evening as it was getting dark. And often, the last thing that I would see on the road was one was flocks of these drongos. Isn't he lovely? Now, drongos are found throughout the world. Well, not throughout the, throughout the old world. They're found all the way into India, where they've got five or six different drongo species. Here we have two. And this one is the fork-tailed version. And here you can see the little mongoose knocking about on the ground underneath him. What he'll be hoping that they do, what the drongo is hoping that they're going to do is to unearth some insects that he can then steal. You'll find them following animals from as big as elephants down obviously to as small as these little dwarf mongoose. So as they move along and they dig in burrows, perhaps they'll unearth a grub or two, or perhaps they'll even unearth a wasp, something like that and the drongos will then fly down, swoop in, hawk them out, quick as a flash, and disappear up into the safety of a tree like that. Hello, Gerda. You're obviously an aficionado of safari, and you can perhaps hear a squirrel alarm calling. It's not, there isn't a squirrel alarm calling, Gerda, and you want to know if it was alarm calling, would it alarm call because of these mongoose? I've never seen a squirrel alarm call because of these mongoose. Certainly a larger mongoose like a slender mongoose, maybe. But these are not tree climbers. And so I think as long as you are in a tree and you're a squirrel, you're pretty safe from one of these chaps. There, he's found something delicious. Mm. So I don't think the squirrel will alarm call that a mongoose. 
Isn't that wonderful? This, of course, is when you see the best stuff, when you sit for a while and things just start to unfold. There's another magpie shrike, replaced the drongo on exactly the same perch. And Brian's just spotted the rest of the flock. They're all there, that's a full length tail. Those are two adults there, part of the flock, probably looking to roost in that thick greenery there where they won't be spotted. Oh, do you think they've got a nest in there, Brian? No, I don't think they do. I think they'll probably just think about roosting <laughs> or fighting. They're having an argument. Oh, there's the youngster on the left, obviously, you can see that, begging, still wants food. Mother's saying, go feed yourself. This is fantastic to see. That really is very, very special. Little baby being disciplined, begging and begging, and mother saying, I'm not gonna feed you. It's time you went off and did something useful on your own. Another youngster there. That's just fantastic. Wow. So as I was saying, especially around this time of the day, if you find yourself sitting quietly, that's when you things just start to unfold around you, like these mongoose running around. We've had drongos, we've had magpie shrikes, we've had hornbills, and just a wonderful atmosphere of the day drawing to a close. Quiet, you can see the inkiness of the night just starting to creep in from the eastern side of the sky. And the breeze that comes up, of course, as the sun sets, starting to flow. I've always loved that sight that you can see there, just as the night starts to kind of, just as the sun will rise from there tomorrow morning. So you can see the night rising from the same direction. I've always loved that. I remember watching it on a train once and feeling a tremendous sense of peace I get while I live out here. Right, what a fantastic, fantastic sighting. Thank you, Brian. Right, we're on Hyena Road. We're quite a long way still from quarantine, so we're going to head towards there. I think if the dogs were going to come across, they probably would have by now. There you can see the western horizon, still painted a beautiful pinkish-orange hue. Sorry, I'm just being a bit silent because I can suddenly hear a a rattle coming from behind, I'm not sure what that is. Hello, Mark on YouTube. A really interesting question, and I'm afraid I'm unable to acquiesce to your request. You want to see a spitting beetle. I don't know what a spitting beetle is, Mark. I'm sorry about that. Can you perhaps maybe send us a picture or send us a, an idea of the family that it belongs to? I'm afraid I've never heard of a spitting beetle. Spitting spiders I've heard of, spitting snakes, of course. Um, but I haven't heard of a spitting beetle, and that's not to say they don't exist. So please give us a little bit more information, and I'll see what we can find out here. Of course, the beetles around here have also been affected by the lack of rain, far fewer than we would see normally, far fewer insects in general than we see normally. Although from the collection gathering around my lamp in the night, you would never say so. And Marla, I believe you were asking about insects and drought, and definitely it's had a profound effect. The insects really do depend seemingly on the, on the water, probably because they depend often on flowers and seeds to survive, and there just aren't many of those around at the moment. But like I say, it does come across, we, we do tend to think of droughts in a very negative way. These, these ecosystems have survived for millennia and millennia, going through drought, and deluge, and flood. And, you know, long after, long before we were here and long after we've gone, that pattern will continue. And it will make no appreciate, appreciable difference to the long-term survival of the area. Yes, of course, it's difficult to watch while it's happening. But 
to the long-term survival of an ecosystem like this. It's just part of the endless cycle that it has been experiencing, well, probably for close on 100 million years. I'm Kathleen in New York, a very interesting question. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <clears throat> a bit dusty out today. Kathleen, an interesting question. You want to know about the man-made dams and the effect that they have had on the dry riverbeds around here and have they changed the flow of water? Well, they've most certainly changed the flow of water. That's inevitable. They can't do anything but. But they're not on major rivers. So they're not like it's dammed the flow of an enormous river. So I think what they do do is more than have an actual effect on the, the flow of the rivers. I think what they do is they collect water that comes down in floods and then the rest kind of spills over and around. And I don't think there's much more of an effect than that, to be honest. I think it would be very different if you put an enormous dam in, say, the Sand River or in the Sabi River, then it would make a huge difference. But there's so little surface flow in these riverbeds anyway that I don't think it makes a huge difference. And certainly when they come down and flood, the dams fill up and things continue as they did before. So that would be what I think. I'm not sure how many long-term studies have been done of vegetation in completely uh, undammed drainage lines and vegetation in others, but certainly I've been in many of both and I can't see any appreciable difference downstream of the dams. Very clever question, thank you. Right, we're coming up to just one of those dams now, the Juma Dam, where there is a hive of activity akin to a graveyard. Nothing going on here at the moment. We're nearly at quarantine clearings. Let's go and see if those doggies have made their way up. Oh, no, there is one buffalo here. Sad soul on his own. No friends. There he is, just over there. I'm sure the hippopotamus is still there to keep him company. The buffalo will go off on a warm night like tonight. The temperature probably won't drop below, say, 23 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about 75, probably even more. It's probably about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. No, it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature will be that this, this evening. And what that will mean is the buffalo will probably go grazing tonight as opposed to during the day when it's very hot. And then on the very cold nights in the winter, they'll graze during the day and huddle together in a nice warming pack during the night. Like penguins in the Antarctic. It's not quite as cold here, though. My favorite kind of viewer is asking a question. Right, a question from Fly Gear. It's from as far as I can understand. Fly Gear, you don't believe necessarily that we are live. Fly Gear, you are asking a question and I'm answering it to, for you in real time. We are very much live. There is a buffalo. I didn't know it was here. I do know now. And he's just grazing, not grazing, he's chewing his cud. And that is his dinner for the evening. Fortunately, he has to regurgitate what he ate earlier and re-eat it now for dinner. As I've said before, and this is especially for you, Fly Gear, I'm glad I don't have to do that. And I'm sure you are as well. On that note, let's head across to Jamie. She's back at Sydney's dam. The two of us have been flogging that horse for quite some time. Let's see if she's been lucky with the dogs. I'm going to hope so. And I'm going to head on to quarantine clearings and see what I can find there. See you shortly. We are making our way back to Sydney's dam, just in case our luck proves to be 
continuing. To be honest, though, it's not going to be the wild, at least that pack of wild dogs, that will make an appearance there. It sounds as though they've gone west from where they were on Simba Bidi, so away from, completely away from the direction of Sydney's dam. The reason I'm going there is as it starts to get cooler, all kinds of animals are going to start moving about. Elephants that James was looking at have crossed onto Simba Bidi. I can just see some grey bottoms disappearing into the bushes. Let's just investigate. I've had some really good luck at Sydney's Dam recently. You never know. You might even get to see Inkanyeni. Wait, was it Inkanyeni that you saw there? No. Which one? Shanuba. Shanuba. It was Shanuba that Brent saw around Sydney's Dam. Wonderful to see a leopard. And they did, by the way, did they did call in, it sounds like, Kutile just to the south of the Arethusa boundary. Our Kutile is a beautiful female leopard who last time I heard had three cubs. I don't know if that is still the case. She had three cubs around the Londolosi boundary. She was wandering back up north every now and again. Let's just investigate. I know that James thinks we're flogging this horse, but you never know what you might find. chatting to one of the Simbambili guides, Tristan, asking for an update on what the Madash were doing. And Sharon, and possibly other new viewers, might want to know what that means. Sharon is wondering, is that code for wild dog? It's not exactly code, it's the local word for wild dog. Thing here, that is around the corner. So Sharon, very often, will utilize the Shangon terms, or sometimes occasionally a mixture of Zulu and Fadagalor, make its way into radio conversation. Fadagalor is the name given to a mish mishmash of the different languages. And it essentially is a good way of keeping that surprise going for your guests. All is quiet at Sydney's Dam hippo out of the water, one making its way out, it's going to slowly exit. We'll keep an eye out for James's crocodile as well. Fortunately, we don't have the super zoom capabilities that James has, making their way for their nocturnal stroll. Time for an evening of feeding in the coolness after a very long, very hot day. It started off so promising with just that little bit of drizzle. It's one of the last few, last, I think there's about three or four hippos remaining around Sydney's dam. But yes, the day started out promising with a bit of drizzle and the sun burned through the clouds very early on. This hippo moving back towards the dam. And one shy kudu. Oh, well, there's also another hippo making his way out. You can see how the depth differs in different parts of the dams. It's interesting to see how once the, our larger dams, like Buffalsook Dam, dried up, we could really get an idea as to the paths and the channels that the hippos had created moving about there, there, the hippo, the kudus coming down. Always pays to approach carefully, make sure that there's nobody waiting to ambush you. For example, a pack of wild dogs. Although I really think I might be pushing my luck at this point. And just to finish off with Sharon's question, it's a good way of keeping some of the sights that your guests might see a surprise on the radio. Also means that if you are far on the other side of the reserve, that your guests don't get disappointed if somebody calls in a leopard and you can't get there in time, depending on the situation. But you as Safari Live viewers get to enjoy a little bit of a background tour of the life of a safari guide. 
and has that hippo emerges from where it was submerged, submerged. Gert was wondering how deep Sydney's dam is. And the answer, Gert, is I would say at the deepest point, probably close to about six feet deep, about two meters in the deepest point, might even be less than that at this point. And those hippos stand about one and a half to close to two meters at the shoulder, not two meters, sorry, one and a half meters to, yeah, two meters at the shoulder. Maybe about half a bit higher, but tall. And that hippo was submerged. So an estimate of six feet or two meters at its deepest point is probably not that far off for the depth of Sydney's dam. And of course, as you all know, hippos cannot swim. They can control their buoyancy levels and they walk along the bottom of the dams and they can push up to go and breathe in cases where the water's too deep for them to stick their nostrils up to the surface. But fascinating that an animal that is evolved for an almost aquatic, aquatic existence is not able to actually physically swim. Their legs are just that bit too stubby, their body is too bulky. And that means they prefer to be around pools where they know they have shallow parts that they can spend the day resting. They also can't hold their breath for all that long. The average is about five to six minutes. I've timed a hippo that stayed under for 12 minutes before. They can, some of the larger ones can stay under for longer. But the average is about five or six minutes before they have to pop up and take a breath. And these hippos will walk all the way for cover many, many miles this evening, looking for grazing potential, and they are forced to cover more ground during this drought. A blacksmith lapwing, letting us know why his name, or why they are called a blacksmith lapwing. Just listen to the sound he's making. Such a striking bird. And blacksmith, because it sounds like hammers on an anvil. Now Darlene is wondering, while we watch this little bird run across the ground, which bird would we consider to be the most intelligent? And she's suggested raven, which is not a bad guess, but they are birds of prey. Darlene, I'm just racking my brains trying to think of which bird I would suggest is the most intelligent. Maybe one of the... Are you hearing something? Hyenas. Hyenas calling. Hyenas calling off in the distance towards the den. Brains picking up on the calls. Darlene, I'm just trying to think. Maybe some of the larger parrot species, they of course are known to have those incredible vocabularies or they learn to speak with human vocabularies. That's fairly intelligent for a bird. I'm trying to think what else would be considered. Most birds are not, and of course the, the clearest example of this is the fallacy of the wise old owl. And in fact with owls, and I'm saying, for some reason South African accents, people don't always understand it when I say the word owl. I'm talking about the O-W-L, those birds of prey that fly at night. So, uh, there's this fallacy that they're wise and very clever. With those enormous eyes, they actually take up so much room within their skulls that a lot of them are not all that intelligent as they're cracked up to be. I'm going to, I think, leave Sydney's dam. It's starting to get dark. Get my spotlight out. Darlene, I'm going to try and just try and figure out what other birds I would consider to be intelligent. Ravens certainly are. It's a good answer. They're known to have problem-solving skills. Indian miners is a very good example. Indian miners, which is an introduced species out here, a species of bird that doesn't really belong and in fact has come through a, in a very clear way it's been to the detriment of the local bird species. They've taken over the gardens in the big cities, for example, around Johannesburg. I know that we've got a huge problem with Indian miners, but they are very intelligent. And my best story, my best example of that was when I was a child, there was a young Indian miner that had fallen into the swimming pool 
and I pulled it out and immediately the rest of the family started dive bombing and attacking me and I promise you for about maybe a year is a slight exaggeration for about six months after that incident they would chase me every single time I went out into the garden. I don't know if it was because they remembered me or if it was because I was a child so I was an easier target because they also used to dive bomb the dogs. But at the time I really felt as though they had some kind of serious vendetta against me. It felt as though they knew it was me. What are the birds? I think the birds of prey are relatively intelligent but also intelligent comes in different ways. So we might have our own definition of intelligence and learning. But the fact that birds can migrate, cover the distances, remember their way back to their nest sites year after year, after traveling, traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles, is something that still to me is quite a phenomenal ability. So that in its own way, maybe not intelligent, but a highly evolved instinct that comes into play. That's definitely one of the best examples of the bird's ability to think things through. And as we come across to the end of our sunset safari, it has been a beautiful evening and I've enjoyed every moment, including the time spent with those peaceful elephant bulls at Arethusa. Tomorrow promises all kinds of exciting surprises. We don't know what it has in store for you, but I'm sure it will be nothing short of spectacular. A big thank you to Brent Leo Smith for his fantastic camera work. He's, he's still doubtful. Um, I think it's safe to say that you're not going to be resigning from your presenter position anytime soon. I think, I think you might be seeing Brent back in the presenter's seat at some point. It is, however, the quietest I've ever known Brent to be whilst on a, <laughs> on a drive with me. It has been an interesting experience. I'm going to send you back across to James for the last few moments of the Sunset Safari. Have a wonderful day, ladies and gentlemen. A beautiful final scene here for us, the zebras walking silhouetted beautifully by that gorgeous orange, ginger and gold sky. Some clouds building, again, they are not going to dump any rain on us, but they have provided us with a spectacular end to the evening. So that, of course, is a marula tree that they are standing underneath. And sadly, they have produced very little in the way of fruit, the marula trees. I'm just going to try and slightly maneuver so we can get another view of the zebra. But the, the marula trees, again, because of the rain, have not produced anything in the way of fruit this year. Outside of the reserves and the communities, of course, people are not so much dependent on marulas as they are. I mean, this is an important time of year because the marulas do provide an important supplement to the sort of local diet, very rich in vitamin C, which is hard to come by out here. And so it has been a difficult time, like I said at the beginning of the drive, not only for the animals, but for the people of the area as well. Very beautiful. I'm just going to talk very quietly now. The zebras can be a little bit skittish around us but they're very happy around us at the moment. And just listen to that quickly. Can you hear that? Beautiful last call of the night from the white brown scrub robin. Ah, oh, it's wonderful. The zebras are listening to something. They're actually watching a hyena look. Look, Brian, there's a hyena just behind them. You'll see it coming in through screen now. There. Oh, a creature of the night out foraging. Salivating, in fact. That is very unseemly for such a beautiful night. Isn't that just stunning? Heading back towards in the direction of the den, that's possibly a male that's been out all day. I'm not going to try and get any closer. Now watch as the herd of zebra, the adults move to put some space between the baby and the hyena, the predator, the second most dominant predator in the area. 
and the stallion there is going to follow the hyena and make sure it goes away. And the hyena has just started running across the road. They are not going to take any chances with the zebra. A zebra is a formidable enemy for something the size of a hyena. Oh, very, very stunning. Right, well, it's time for us to press on to go and enjoy our Friday night, as I hope you are all doing. Uh, some of you will be on Saturday in Fiji, perhaps in America. You are on Friday morning. I hope the day is a good one for you. Big thank you to all of our new viewers for your questions and comments. It's been wonderful to hear from you, and we love hearing from our new viewers and our old viewers too, but please remember to tell us where you're from. Thank you, Brian, thank you, for your efforts. Thank you to Kirsty and Jerry in the final control. A big thank you to Brent and Jamie on the other vehicle. We will see you tomorrow morning at 05.30, bright and early. Well, it won't be that bright, but we'll see you then with happiness. See you then. Bye-bye.